evening. Welcome to the Larkspur City Council meeting. It is wonderful to see so many faces out there, and what a beautiful evening we have. So uh, it is 6.30, and Jamie, our city clerk, can you please uh, do the roll call? Um, Councilmember Hara? Here. Councilmember Way? Here. Councilmember Hilmer? Here. Vice Mayor Chu? Here. And Mayor Morrison? Here. And if you're able to, please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you. So public comment. We're going to open it to the public. And if, does anybody have anything to say that's not, not on the agenda tonight? Please come up and state your name and where you're from. Glad to hear what you have to say. To the microphone, please. I'm Conrad Williams. I live at 2130 Redwood Highway, D14, Greenbrae, California. I am a musician and have taught piano and entertained here in Marin most of my life. Our family moved here in 1953 when my mother got a job teaching school in Tam Valley. When my parents retired, they moved back to Salem, Oregon, where they grew up. After dad died, my mom needed someone to care for her. I was playing piano at the Mayflower Inn on weekends, so I needed a place close by where I could care for her. I found a roomy double wide mobile home here in Marin Mobile Home Park. I've lived there now 27 years. It was affordable rent. I fixed it up. Gradual increases in rent, three and five year leases were the, were the highest of 3% or the cost of living. Now suddenly, the rent is jumping up again and again. 10% last year and another 10% starting in June. At the mediation, we had mediation, I asked for moderation and was advised by the owners to check with realtors to see what my home was worth. I can't afford the big rent raises. I have a grand piano and some large paintings and furniture. If I have to leave, the management said they'd pay me something but that's after deducting the cost of tearing down and hauling away my home so they can move in a new one. They don't want to try to keep up an old used home. There's no place for me to move that I can afford. And a senior home, if I can find one, won't let me bring my grand piano and other things. My life will be destroyed. I trade at Lucky Pharmacy. I attend church at Larkspur's Redwood Presbyterian. I watch cricket at Piper Park and I walk on King Mountain. This is my town. But you can change the story. My whole neighborhood is cringing with the increases, not just the rent, but the service costs. The trash people have told me that you're the ones who set their charges. Sewer and garbage now add up to uh, almost $100 a month. PG&E and AT&T have to give me care rates because I'm a low-income person. But not local services, why? We need rents to go up, not more than the cost of living. Please, can you give us rent control? The park has cut back on staff. The office is open only till five o'clock and they have started crowding the front of the mobile home section of their property with more RV parking. And I hear their rental spaces have been shooting up faster than ours. We need your help to stay a community and not a commodity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We heard you. Please come up. And your name and where you live, please. Hi, I'm Linda Frender. I live at 49 Chanticleer Street. And I'm just going to read for you the letter that we presented to you guys about the um, Amazon Reuse Boxes Initiative. Dear Larkspur City Council, we request your endorsement of an Amazon to Reuse Boxes Initiative on behalf of the students of Redwood High School and the residents of Larkspur. We are petitioning Amazon to do a pilot Amazon pickup program in Marin County in which delivery trucks pick up used Amazon boxes on subsequent deliveries and return them to where Amazon warehouses for reuse. Hank Colley, Conservation International Senior Vice President of Environmental Leadership in Business, is advising us. 
He has directed us to, number one, collect 10,000 signatures to demonstrate that there is sufficient interest among Amazon customers in Marin to offer the program, and two, garner endorsements from local government in the cities of Marin to elevate the issue inside Amazon. Support for an Amazon pickup program is widespread in Marin, and signatures have climbed to over 4,000 online and in person. The city of Belvedere has endorsed the initiative already. In its climate action plan, the city of Larkspur has committed to the reduction of waste through reuse and recycling. The reuse of cardboard boxes is key to this goal. Reuse eliminates the environmental and economic cost of curbside handling, long distance trucking, labor intensive sorting, and methane gas emissions from decomposing cardboard. But most importantly, reuse eliminates the need to remanufacture boxes. It conserves natural resources, timber, water, and causes no pollution. According to USA Today, on June 8, 2018, on average, 25% of all cardboard is recycled in the United States. 75% goes to the landfill. 100 million Amazon Prime members placed an estimated 5.2 billion orders a year worldwide. Based on these numbers, over 3.5 billion Amazon boxes go to the landfill annually. We need to safeguard the beauty of Marin County. Please, number one, support the Amazon to reuse boxes petition, and two, provide a link on the City of Larkspur website for residents to read about the initiative. The link is listed on here. Thank you. If you give that to Jamie, that'd be wonderful. Please come on up. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And your my, name and where are you from, My please? name is Bridget Gleason. I live at 2130 Redwood Highway, space D5, in the Marin Park Mobile Home Park. I'm here representing a group of tenants. Would the other people from Marin Park please stand up? Thank you. You may have been to our little community that's part of Larkspur Green Bray. Maybe you haven't been. We are 88 homes that for the most part house retirees, disabled persons, and um, young families starting out. It is a true affordable housing area, or it always has been until the last couple of years. I moved there 24 years ago when I was raising a teen beginning to be a teenager as a single mom. And it's been a wonderful place. It backs on a beautiful natural area. It's a great and convenient place to be. I am a fairly um, atypical member of the community because I have a reasonably high paying full-time job. Most of the people in this community that's not true for, as I said, they're retired, they're disabled, or they're not high income earners. And this community is in the process of being destroyed. Um, we, um, if you aren't familiar with the way mobile homes work, for the most part, you own your own home. Um, some of the homes in the park, as Conrad mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, if he can't afford to move the home out, which is a tens of thousands dollar project, they will tear it down and put a brand new unit and then that will just be a rental space altogether. But in my home, I rent the space. However, it's not like an apartment situation in which my landlord takes care of fixing anything that goes wrong. I need to do some foundation work. Last year, I needed to do some skirting work around the house. All of that is out of my own pocket. Um, we're going to be coming back to you in the future with some proposals. We're working with Marin Legal Aid and the Marin Organizing Committee. Um, but we came today because just coincidentally, I saw when I was looking at your minutes that you had passed the fair housing resolution in your last meeting and that April was fair housing month. So Joan, who's actually been the person, the convener of this group, um, and I decided that it was apropos to come now and tell you that this is a serious problem for 88 households and we are going to be seeking your help. What exactly that help will end up, what we'll end up requesting, I don't know, but we need help in this community. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> no, we, we are, 
We are so happy you're here, and that is what public um, uh, comments are all about. And Ms. Purnell has reached out to me, and uh, we'll reach out to the, uh, my colleagues. And I'm going to get together with uh, the Marin Organizing and the Marin Legal Aids and, sh and someone else from the residents of the mobile home. And, uh, and two other nonprofits. So we are aware. I'll make sure my colleagues um, hear from everybody. So um, we have listened, we are concerned, and we will continue this discussion. All right? Promise. All right, thank you. So you're more than welcome to continue staying here if, if, to, to listen more. If not, you're more than welcome to, to exit also. It literally. <coughs> Well, we do, yes, but. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I, no worries. You're welcome. We'll, we'll see you again soon. You're welcome. Bye. Mike, I'm sorry. Are you disappointed? <laughs> Hello, Police Chief Michael Norton. How's the golf game? It is, could be a lot better. You're welcome. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Hang on. Good clear out. Yeah. It's, uh, Mike, thank on. you, Mayor Morrison and hang members on just of the for council. Just a second, please. Oh, sure. The door is going to close after this. Shannon, would you close the door? Or, yeah, great. All right. Uh, let me see, Mike, let me introduce you. Um, public comment is closed. So now we have a presentation from our police chief, Michael Norton, uh, about the Central Marine Police Authority yearly update. Nice to see you and thanks for being here. Thanks. So um, as you know, this is a once a year municipal code requires us to come in and present um, some data on traffic collisions and um, traffic enforcement, basically. And over the years, we've added a few crime statistics too, just because seems like the council members have wanted it. Um, I'll go through this rather quick because I know there's some other, there's other people here with agenda items. Feel free to stop me at any point if you need any clarification or um, something like that. There's going to be a lot of data on this. I'll probably just hit on a few points and move on to the next slide. So um, first off, oh, why don't I turn this on? There we go. Um, we had 44,426 calls for service in our jurisdiction last year, Corte Madero, Larkspur, and San Anselmo. In Larkspur alone, we had 18,089. This is for calendar year 2018, all these numbers. That was an increase of 18% in Larkspur from the previous year. And overall, we had that 44,000 number was an increase of 13%. So some of that is being a little more proactive, but we are seeing just more and more people calling in and asking for our help on various issues. Um, in terms of where the calls for service are, um, this is our whole jurisdiction, but in Larkspur, um, as usual, it's mainly shopping centers. You'll see Bon Air Shopping Center, Marine Country Mart, Redwood High School, and this one's kind of new this year, Cal Park Tunnel. We had 364 calls for service in 2018. A lot of that was um, due to transient calls, and our officers also um, being proactive and walking the hillsides. That's generally the location we give for when an officer goes out on the hillside. Um, we have a lot of residents um, from all over, but mainly from Villa La Cumbra that can get a good view from their house to maybe things we can't see and advise us when encampments are starting to go up. Um, we find it's a little easier to go out there and contact people early on rather than later before too much gets moved in. Um, in terms of our top calls for service, the good news is in your top five, none of those are crime. But um, as you can see, traffic stops are one of the major things we were, um, citizens are asked of us and we were doing in 2018. And um, extra patrols, which are coincide with traffic stops, a lot of that can just be uh, walking around areas where crime's occurring and things like that. In terms of traffic stops, Overall, in our entire jurisdiction, we did f over 5,000 traffic stops in 2018. That was an increase of 46% since 2017. Um, and um, in Larkspur alone, we had an increase of 72% with traffic stops. Once again, that's mainly um, citizen complaint oriented. We have people email and call us all the time. And I know, unfortunately, often they feel like it starts with, I never see you, you're not doing this. Um, we had an increase of 72% in 2018, and I the level of complaints hasn't gone down, it's gone up still. I'm not getting, please enough, you know, we see you too much doing traffic control. Um, so just so you know, we're kind of uh, 
stretch to the hilt on that right now in terms of how much traffic enforcement we can do. Um, a little more specifically in Larkspur alone, um, there's, you see the 2,200 traffic stops. A lot of this is complaint oriented and also what we're seeing. Our number one spot for making um, stops was East Drake and Larkspur Landing Circle. It's not a lot of surprise as if you've ever tried to drive through there in the afternoon. It's a bit of a mess and often we have people running lights, making illegal U-turns, rights, blocking intersections, which causes a lot of problem, not stopping for pedestrians, things like that. Uh, Redwood High School is a lot too. That, that spot is for, um, it could be the stop signs in front of Redwood, but often it's speeding issues on Doherty, which we hear from a lot and we observe considering it's directly in front of our police station. Yeah. For what it's worth, I, I got a speeding ticket there when I was 16 years old, so. <laughs> oh, it was. I was a 16 year old, I was not, not very bright. Um, and then also Magnolia and Creekside. Um, we worked that for speed and um, there's a kind of a mid intersection. Well, it's not a mid intersection, but we have a crosswalk there that um, people call in a lot and say they're having issues there. So we go do some pedestrian enforcement. In terms of reports, um, these are calls for service where we go out and we actually, an officer will take a paper report that gets filed. It could be arrest, it could be um, someone's car was broken into the night before or at a shopping center, someone's ho home was broken into. Um, in our total, in Larkspur in 2018, we took 1,050 reports. Those can take anywhere from about start to finish with all our staffing, two to eight hours, depending on the complexity of the report. Um, we took 10, uh, 1,050, it remained pretty constant throughout our jurisdiction, which is good. It means there wasn't a big spike in crime or anything like that. Specifically looking at crime, I'm gonna verbally, uh, there wasn't enough room to put like comparisons on here, but I'll verbally go through some of the, the uh, high points for Larkspur specifically with, these are our major crimes that I like to report on. Some good news is um, residential burglary in Larkspur, that's where someone's home was broken into. We had only four in 2018. In 2017, we had 21. Um, commercial burglaries where someone enters a business with the intent to commit a felony. They usually bring wire clippers or a, a booster bag. Those went down from 21 to 15. General larceny and theft right here at 60. That was 188 in 2017. And vehicle thefts where someone's car, car was stolen. We had four and that was down from 17 the year before. Um, DUI and drug violations went up significantly. Um, they almost doubled on drug violations. That is not marijuana, that's narcotics, methamphetamine, um, fentanyl, heroin, things like that. Um, 63 of those, those are, all, those are pretty much all arrests. And um, DUIs went up pretty significantly from 20 to 35. That could be, um, that's a combination of alcohol, pills, or marijuana, they're all considered DUI. In terms of unlocked vehicle, that's where someone leaves their car unlocked and it gets um, gone through. It seems like um, we've had a pretty good decrease across the board with that. I'm hoping a lot of that is just our residents are getting a little more educated and wiser and locking their cars now, more so than they have in the past. Um, that went down to 18 from 55 the year before. Um, bike thefts unfortunately went up in Larkspur, but down in some of our other jurisdictions, it went from 30 to 45. And a lot of those bike thefts, you know, they're not the old days, the $90 Schwinn. A lot of those bikes are in the 5,000 and up range. Um, and then auto burglaries, that's where a window gets smashed generally. And um, it happens mainly in our shopping centers or around our gyms. Um, those went from 80 down to 52. Unfortunately, we're seeing a big spike in that in the beginning of 2019, and we're in the process of working closely with our shopping centers and doing a lot of extra patrol. That's a Bay Area-wide issue um, that we're all dealing with, unfortunately. Um, report stats, this is just where the bulk of our reports, as you can see across our jurisdiction, mainly shopping centers. That's because our jurisdiction, the bulk of our crime is property crime and it's occurring either in a business or a car and most of those auto break-ins, like I said, are at the shopping center. Um, as you can see up here, in terms of Larkspur, you have Bonaire Center, Marine Country Mart, Cost Plus, Redwood High School, um, and the Lucky Supermarket Shopping Center. Oh, and um, East Drake at uh, Larkspur Landing right there. Those are probably mostly um, accidents, those 19, obviously not crime. And I'll get to accidents a little later on. And in terms of where our crimes actually are, 
um, the bulk are burglaries, whether it's auto, commercial, or residential, petty theft, grand theft, like I said, property crimes. Um, most of it's middle of the day is when it's occurring. So, and it's also a lot of our vehicle break-ins or commute times and at night. So this is a general overview of the actual traffic citations. This um, melds moving and parking together. Um, we do do a lot of um, parking enforcement in Larkspur with the downtown area, and we do have some zones that are marked for two hour around town. Um, combined moving and parking, we issued um, 9,218 citations. That was an increase of 41% from the year before. And um, our number one spot in all our jurisdictions issuing 87 citations was Easter Francis Drake and Larkspur Landing. And I can pretty much guarantee you those are all during evening commute hours. Um, also in Larkspur, 395 Doherty, that was what I was talking about. Um, that's basically the speed issue on Doherty Drive and the stop signs. And occasionally someone, there's like a no left turn during certain times that causes problems and we'll enforce that as well. Um, in terms of parking, um, we do get called out to Redwood High School still quite a bit, 161 there. And this is also the other lot of Larkspur, 100 there. So we're actually busier doing parking enforcement in Redwood than we are downtown generally, even though we go out to both equally. Um, let's see, this is just one more image of the moving and parking. Uh, Larkspur moving citations, uh, about 1,000, an increase of 33% from the, the year before. And parking, we had 1,358, and that was an increase of 11% from the year before. Overall, the amount of citations we wrote in Larkspur for moving violations was about 41% of the total when you compare it, Lark, uh, Corte Madera and San Anselmo together. And um, our, our top five locations, this is for parking and moving citations. The only one that's moving here is East Sir Francis Drake. These other ones are parking locations. Um, Magnolia is your downtown. Via Hidalgo is actually in a kind of, um, if you're not we're familiar, right off Bonaire Road by Marin General Hospital. There's some hour zoned over there for some medical facilities and stuff like that. So we get asked to go out there. Uh, traffic collisions. So the whole reason we write more tickets, um, we don't get any revenue really from it, to be honest with you, about for every uh, dollar that a citizen has to pay for the fine and the court costs and all that, the city recoups about 20%. So it is not a revenue maker opposed, so that's not why we do it. It's to decrease traffic collisions. That's the main reason we do it, and that's the main reason we enforce areas where we've had accidents or we feel accidents will happen if we don't go out and do something to slow people down or make them more aware. Um, in Larkspur, we did have a slight increase this year of 4%. We had 287 collisions um, over the year, 725 total um, throughout our jurisdiction. Let me just see what we have here. Um, and once again, uh, the bulk of our collisions for Larkspur was, um, there was 20 of them at Easter Francis Drake and Larkspur Landing, and that's why we did a lot of a traffic enforcement there. And we also um, had a lot at the Greenbrae Interchange, which is that on-off ramp, basically, at uh, Easter Francis Drake and 101. That's always uh, been a bit of a problem ever since I've been an officer here. You can see there's some other collisions too. The 250 Doherty is not the crosswalk outside our station. That is just a generic catch-all. If someone came in and there was a collision that probably got classified wrong. And then the bulk of them in Larkspur, you'll see are shopping centers. Those are low speed. And a lot of those are, they're technically traffic accidents, but someone goes into shop, they come out later and there's a huge door ding or their tail lights broken. It's like one of the worst feelings, right? Um, those are technically hit and run traffic accidents. So you can see kind of our jurisdictional wide summary of those right here. And you'll see um, accidents with no injury and hit and run property damage only, those are almost entirely low speed in shopping centers or business parks. And that's the bulk of our accidents in our jurisdiction, which is good. Minor injury accidents, that can be whiplash, um, maybe a laceration to the face, and then you have major injury, which would be generally uh, needing to be transported to the hospital. And once again, this kind of uh, reiterates that under traffic collisions. Um, the only ones that are not shopping centers up here are the Green Bay Interchange and Easter Francis Drake with 20 and 10 accidents respectively. And um, the, the 2 p.m. on a weekday is essentially when the bulk of ours are occurring, which makes sense. It's not happening in the middle of the night. Um, 
Hit and run felony, if you're wondering what that is, that's where you cause an accident that actually injures someone else and you don't stop. So those are actually, I consider the most serious of these. Um, they are felonies. And um, other than that, that is all I have for the statistics. Nice, nice presentation uh, update. Thank thanks. you. So, council members. Oh, I even get applause. <laughs> 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 don't leave, don't leave. We have questions for okay. you. But this fascinates us, by the way. So, uh, questions from the council members? Uh, sure. Um, so, I, I'm just reflecting on a few years ago, we had a, a lot of class one felony bank robberies. Has that, is, was that just a fluke, or are we seeing that bank robberies in Marin are less, or in our jurisdiction less? I think they're, they're less overall, I, and Bay Area-wide. We oh. get kind of crime alerts from all over. I think what we see is crime trends kind of, they go down and then they come up, and sometimes they go down and you never really hear from them again. Um, right now it's automobile burglaries. The two years prior to this, it was bicycle thefts, and even though you did have an uptick in 2018, we're not seeing a lot of those right now. and. Um, it's really the crime will continue until we, we catch somebody or our citizens um, get educated. And that's why we're always doing social media education and trying to do a lot of that is we, you can educate a lot of crime away, especially in Marin, because mm -hmm. most of the people we're catching do not live in the county. So it's not worth them coming into our county if there's, we're, we're not easy targets anymore. Mm. So residential burglaries, we, I remember some years we've had a ton of those and they're almost all unlocked houses or mm -hmm. unlocked doors. And the moment when people start um, getting alarm systems and locking their doors and things like that, it really goes down. Mm -hmm. Bicycles, I know people, anyone who's probably gotten a $5,000 bicycle, we don't get a lot of repeat victims because it's, it's brutal. It's not insured and it's a big hit to the pocketbook and, and they're much more protective from yeah. that point on. And, and a lot of those bicycle thefts just come, you know, side of the house. It's not necessarily always on your, your car. You know, they'll look for those because it's a big ticket item. And um, we're about to do a big push with our shopping centers, the two big ones in Corte Madera, but also Country Mart and Bon Air. I'll be reaching out to them because we want to use them and their security team along with us to really educate people. I think there's always been a, st a stigma of it's afraid to acknowledge there may be a crime problem, but people know it. And, and I think people are much more upset when their car gets broken into as opposed to, I don't think people are gonna run away from a shopping center because a flyer gets left saying like, hey, protect your valuables. You know, car break-ins do occur around here. Right. So. Mm -hmm. I was just curious about that because I remember a lot of, we had, uh, right. whether they were apprehended in our jurisdiction and the bank robbery happened further um, yeah, east so, or west. Yeah, sorry, I kind of went all over That's the place. That's all right. But bank robbery specifically, it's usually, um, they, they always get caught eventually, and they're always serial. No one just does it once and yeah. waits six months. It's usually due to like a, a narcotic habit mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll hit pretty routinely every one to two weeks. And we actually, the county pitches in and has a really good uh, analytical person for us now that we didn't used to have. She actually prepares this report for me. And um, it's pretty cool. She can look at all the data, and she'll go, most likely they live within a mile of this point. And this is when they hit, and this is when they do that, and it's it's oh. pretty cool, and that's how we end up catching a lot of that them nowadays. That guy in Nevada, or, or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else, Larry? Yeah, um, you know, probably the thing that we get emails or comments about, you know, you, and you get them as well, is people feeling like there's a lack of enforcement, and yet that's not really the case. No. What, what's the best way to re respond to that? Because you know, one of the things we see here in the statistics, for example, is uh, if you break it down by the number of enforcement actions per day, you know, that's not a big number, but you also have a lot of other things to do. Yeah, the way enforcement works is basically if people are calling 911 or their car's getting broken into or in this, our officer's time is, that's what it's being dedicated to because we, we can't go, well, we're not going to come out to your house and look at your house that got broken into because I want to do some traffic enforcement. It's just not what police are, our expectations are. Um, enforcement and patrol takes a back seat when we have other things going on and we're busy. And as our calls for service go up, you know, there was a big uptick there, um, that's affected. It, it, there is quite a bit of enforcement. What we found generally is, you know, really looking at it and using stealth box data where we put a, let's say for speed, we can put a little uh, device up. We do it occasionally and it'll measure the speeding and I'll, we'll do that and go, is it worth even enforcing this? Yeah, the citizen is right. These people are going fast. We'll go out and enforce it really hard. 
and then we go back and put the device back up. And generally, we, I've, it, very rarely does it decrease the speed, and that's unfortunate. Um, I'm not sure if it ever worked. The theory has always been you do traffic enforcement and people will slow down and they're afraid of it. I don't really see that, to be honest, and that's why um, one of the big things I would tell people is it's not it's enforcement and it's engineering, right? So a lot of the time I'm working closely with Julian over there. I'm not calling you out, but I'm, <laughs> this is a good thing. He's like hiding. So you're public works director, right? We work together and, and I'm, he might say, hey, is there any problems out here? Thus I'm getting complaints or I'll go, I'm getting complaints. Is there anything we can do? And um, that's where a lot of the traffic calming solutions start from is citizen complaints. And we have started a, um, a new email, traffic concerns at uh, centralmarinepolice.org, which seems to be going pretty well, because at least um, you know we're able to respond via email to people and give them a little bit more info than if they just call in and talk to our dispatcher who's handling 911 calls and goes, "Thank you, bye." You know, um, you know, other than an incredible high amount of staffing, which the city, frankly, we just don't have the budget for. You're not going to have a ton more enforcement, but. We are doing it. We are listening. It's not like we're we're shining people on, and I think the numbers actually show a pretty big increase in that from the year before. But I don't. You're not going to have another big jump next year when I come back here. Hopefully, it'll be about the same. So, um, when you look at enforcement in terms of where people live, are the, are the vast majority of them? You know, at one point, you know, it was around like 80 percent of the people actually live in Larkspur. Um, it depends. You know, if it's if it's Magnolia or Doherty, you're going to have a lot of people from. It could be from Ross, Kenfield, Larkspur. If if I'm asked to do enforcement up on Alicia or Villa Cumbra, yeah, it's mostly residents up there. And those are the few times where we actually see it. It helps when it's it is residents. Sometimes neighbors are behaving badly to each other and being discourteous, and um, we don't have to write a ton of tickets, and you can see an improvement. But it's when it's on main corridors. Mm -hmm it's hard to, to have a, a real distinct effect um, on, on the poor driving. And we see it really in San Anselmo because we enforce like the hub and Drake and it feeds Larkspur, Sleepy Hollow, I mean, not Larkspur, Fairfax, Sleepy Hollow, West Marin, has like 40,000 people travel through it. And we can just sit out there for months and write tickets and the speeding doesn't even move an inch on the needle. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. No? Dan? What were you driving when you got the ticket at 16? <laughs> I was driving, it was a pretty sweet ride actually. It, it cost me $600 and it was a, a 1980 rabbit that I had to push to start half the time. And uh, it didn't have a door handle so I had to roll down the window and kind of reach out. It was pretty cool. Did your mom know you got the ticket? Oh yeah, because that was right in the beginning when parents had. See, because I was working, I was working with your mother. I don't remember her yeah. telling me about this. Uh, she's probably embarrassed, especially because it's right in front of the police station. So we have something in common. Mine was a push-button Dodge Dart. Oh, Take it on Doherty. <laughs> oh, hopefully that wasn't. Mike, me. Um, you mentioned uh, parking tickets at Redwood. So how is the Marina Redwood? How are they getting along? How's it going? Um, I might defer to the manager on that one. <laughs> Um, did you want to address that? <laughs> exactly. We just haven't heard lately. So. I haven't been hearing a lot personally. Yeah. Neither have I. So, I, interestingly enough, after you passed the uh, preferential parking program, we reached out to the Marina neighborhood through their property owner association and asked if they wanted to renew their interest in having a preferred parking program and they have yet to do that. I don't know if I haven't yet had a chance to hear why they haven't followed up, um, but they've at this time elected not to. Um, you may recall that we informed you after our interviews with the high school that a lot of times the marina's deeper impacts occur about now as sophomores are obtaining their par their driver's licenses and they don't have parking at the school. So one reason we may have had a lot of silence is a combination of the new programs at the school and the fact that those sophomores are just coming online to drive now. Uh, I will say other areas have contacted us out of concern and I know from talking to my counterpart in Corte Madera, there's a lot of concern there now uh, that they're feeling 
impacts. Um, some of that stems from the fact that uh, the high school instituted the program that uh, once you're parked on campus, you can't leave, you can't drive off campus. Um, we understand there may be a number of kids who are electing to park, particularly on the Corte Madera side of the Santa Marker Trail, so they can run to their car, drive as quickly as they can somewhere to buy lunch, drive back, and come back to school. That seems to be anecdotally the new problem. Um, and the marina doesn't yet seem to be hitting that, having that quite as much, um, but we'll see. We did a lot of enforcement and we still are out there. And I think before it was kind of, you felt like maybe you get one ticket a week if you parked in that area. And then I think, and it was almost like, whether it was the kids or parents were like, we can afford that. And then I think we were, they were getting it every day. And according to my traffic enforcement, there's very, they were get very few tickets out there anymore when they go out there. So I think it's, kind of push the problem somewhere else yeah chief norton thank you very thank much you. wonderful you're doing a great job you and your staff thank you all right we'll move on we'll move on to the approval of the consent calendar any council members want to pull something from the consent calendar i see none i'll move it to the public anybody from the public want to remove anything from the consent calendar i see not He's sleeping? Okay. So I'll bring it back to the council, and may I have a motion for approval, please? So moved. A second? All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I see none. It passes. Great. City Manager's Report, Dan Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, you know, this evening is is going to feature conversation with all the departments. So a lot of what I might update, I'm going to defer and let probably come out through those conversations. But I did want to remind uh, the council and the community that, um, as we stated at our last meeting, Supervisor Katie Rice has, uh, through the county, organized a forum that's going to occur on May 4th at the Embassy Suites at 10 a.m. Uh, with a focus on uh, preparedness for fire, wildfire concerns. So we encourage uh, folks who are interested in that topic to look into attending. And if you go to firesafemarin.org, the website has the information to attend the forum. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Great. Thank you, Dan. All right. Um, now we'll move on to council members' report. Anybody have anything to share with us? No? Okay, I'll, I'll make mine quick, it's quite brief. The Locksburg Library Community Foundation, they've raised so far $257,000. And that is, includes our city's second 50,000 matching grant. Um, they are in the process of doing a feasible study, which is gonna be done via phone or uh, email. And then for their community outreach, they're gonna initiate a small group meetings in five towns which is Larkspur, Greenbrae, Kenfield, Ross, and Corte Madera, which they're gonna have coffees. So they are really, uh, task force, they're quite dedicated and very, very busy. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, they chose the Business Citizen of the Year. Uh, they can't share that with us yet. I know who it is, but it's, it's no one that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, wine Stroll is being planned. They already have nine wineries confirmed, and the Larkspur Community Foundation is going to assist them with the, uh, with the wine stroll. They don't have a date as of yet. They just, um, then the, let's see, the Larkspur Chamber of Commerce, they will promote member businesses with a feature in the San Francisco Chronicle. A digital is called Story Studio. A Story Studio is a digital advertisement for the San Francisco Gate for the North Bay, and it's free to all members. Okay, okay that's and all. Oh, and the ribbon cutting is tomorrow at 515 at Shake Shack. Everyone is welcomed. All right, we'll move on to public hearing. 7.1, amendments to the fee schedule of the city of Larkspur. So um, recommend to adopt resolution 2019, amending the fee schedule for the city of Larkspur. So Dan, do we have a staff report or are you gonna report? Um, yes, Madam Mayor. So annually the um, city council visits the fee schedule and uh, adopts uh, that schedule based on either uh, if the city's done a, if staff's provided a full analysis of our cost recovery 
uh, program or in many years it's a pre-programmed cost of living adjustment that you agreed to when the last full study was done. That's the situation that we have this year is that we have a fee schedule um, that's effectively being adjusted by the index that you chose, the consumer price index that you selected for making these adjustments. Um, and there are a few things I want to highlight. Um, we are making a number of procedural adjustments within this fee schedule that are designed to help uh, particularly our planning and building department uh, as they manage projects that come in. So there's some adjustments here on the taking in of deposit amounts, um, both initially and then how they'll be returned. Um, there's also some fees that were adjusted with respect to noticing. Uh, we also adjusted some of the public works permit categories and then um, some of the categories for using public property. So that's when folks, for example, take out a permit to, to use, to encroach into our right of way, for example. Um, and we continue to look carefully with the aid of a third party at our cost recovery program to make sure that uh, we're, our fees are appropriate to recover our costs, but not designed to exceed our costs. And so we feel confident that the schedule continues to be compliant in that regard. With that, Madam Mayor, I'll turn it back to the council for questions. Great, thanks, Dan. Anybody have any questions? I know I do. Dan, I think it, it sounds very reasonable uh, with the list, and I really like this um, this unused deposit amounts, which will be refunded. I think that's very fair. So I, that's that's great that you have that in there. So um, all right, with that, so we don't have any questions. May I have a motion to pass resolution number twenty nineteen. You may want to th see if there's any members of the public. Oh, thanks, Dan. I don't see anybody out there, but I'll ask anyone. Anyone from the public like to speak? <laughs> I don't see anyone out there who wants to say anything. I'll bring it back to the council. I'd be happy to make a motion to uh, uh, pass resolution number 2019. Great. And may I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I see none. It passes. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing and move on to business items, which is 8.1, a point Larkspur citizen of the year. So council members, would you like to um, nominate? We do have four, and I have them listed. I, I, would anyone like to say who would like, they'd like to nominate? If not, I, okay, <laughs> all right. So I put forward Noel Shumway. Um, okay. Oh, wait, Dan Madam Mayor, I, I'm a little confused. If okay. there are uh, nominations that are in the possession of any member of the council, I think for compliance with the Brown Act, I'd like them all to be listed. I, I don't, um, okay. Uh, Can you list them? I, I, I heard members of the council suggest oh. there, are four nomin there are four nominees. So this so. is who I know. I know of um, Perry Butler, let's see, um, Joe Jennings, and Noel Shemway. And I believe it was Joan Lundstrom, Joe and Joe and Joan Lundstrom. Or was it Lundstrom or Lou? Oh, is it Lou? I, well, it said Joe, but Lou. Lou and Joan Lundstrom. I'm not sure Lou's last name. Lou's last name is Schwartz. I always Schwartz. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the four names that I That's am what I was aware of. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate your clarifying Thanks, Dan, that. for keeping me on track. You do a good job at that. So just for a point of clarification, are you asking for a motion for one of those individuals? Or, what, or, or you guys, whoever nominated the individuals can talk about them. I'd like to hear more about reasons why. I have a question. Of course. Dan? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, have any council members uh, contacted the family of Mr. Shumway? I know in the past, uh, when D uh, Ms. Don Graff was nominated for this honor, we contacted his family to, to uh, gauge how they would feel about it and got their consent before we uh, made such an, an action. Good point. I have it now. Thank you. But I do know the city has reached out to the family and sent flowers and... At the time of Mr. Shumway's passing, exactly. yes. And letters of appreciation. I do know that occurred. But I think you have a good point there, Dan, because that... I wouldn't want to presume 
Yeah, his wife has passed also, so um, hmm. didn't think of that. Okay. Okay. Kevin, would you so like? So, is this a discussion or? It's, it's a discussion of the four individuals we just yeah. mentioned. No, and I and um, uh, I've had a conversation with you about my own preferences mm -hmm. about this, and mm -hmm. um, I uh, would strongly encourage uh, a nomination of Perry Butler for this honor. Uh, that was something I uh, was encouraging last year, and I think it's uh, it's time for him to be recognized for the significant contribution he's made to our community. Okay, may I, may I add to, to that conversation? Um, so Perry, Perry's Restaurant is our top 25 sales generator. Hmm. And uh, his restaurant reaches out to more than just the city of Larkspur. Um, people travel miles to enjoy Perry's ambiance, friendliness, its community meals and libation, along with its neighbor, neighbor gathering place. Uh, more often than not, Perry is there to greet you. Um, Perry supports our local schools by donating certificates for fundraising and teams with scholarships. Lacrosse team, when I was there, came up to thank them. They, it, was, it was adorable. Perry was there. The long line of the lacrosse team individually was shaking Perry's hand to show appreciation. In fact, um, on certain evenings, he has half-price hamburgers, half-price wines, which usually gets donated to local causes charities. In fact, Catherine Way, if I remember, he, you, I was a celebrity bartender. you were for what, for, for a gala or something, wasn't he? He donated uh, to the Shurik Center for, um, for a fundraiser, yes. And then he also does community events. He does Fourth of July. He closes down his driveway, has a barbecue with complete band and a bouncy house for kids. Halloween, he decorates his, um, the restaurant, and then he, he offers candies to the kids and activities for the kids and cocktails and savories for the adults. He does Christmas tree lighting. Um, this is the fourth year that they're going to do uh, fundraising, and they're going to go ahead and give the funds to our new Central Marin Fire Authority. Oh. So, and he also worked hard on measuring, on passing Measure B. So I think Larry Butler and his family and his restaurant does so much for our community. Sounds good. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to that? Sure. The most important thing that he does is allows the Planning Commission to have their annual holiday party there every year, <laughs> uh, which is a source of great uh, anticipation for those of us who have a connection with that uh, enterprise. That so. too. Gee, uh, Mr. Butler was so kind and, and generous um, to be a, a, a signatory on the on the ballot measure in support of our sales tax measure, and and the way that he, uh, I have an anecdote. Uh, he he had uh, surgery, and the day after surgery, he was in his home and welcomed me into his home to consider and and do this for the city. So I I really want to express my gratitude and I think it's very appropriate. I'd, I'd like to make a motion <laughs> Super. Uh, to uh, 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 have us recognize Perry Butler as the Larkspur Citizen of the Year. May I have a second? Second. I guess it's really not a motion. Do we do hands, I guess, mm -hmm. or? No. No. All in favor. Okay. You're, you're good. All in favor. Aye. 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 Anyone oppose? I see none. Perry Butler is going to be our Citizen of the Year. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. We move on to 8.2. We're going to have department budgets, goals, and objectives. This is the fun part. We're going to hear from everybody. Uh, Madam Mayor, this is uh, the kickoff of our annual budget season. And uh, frankly, it's one of my favorite parts of our practice. And that's the opportunity for each of the senior managers to uh, present to you some of the accomplishments they have achieved in the past or actually in the current fiscal year, what some of their goals and initiatives for the upcoming fiscal year are. Um, a little dabbling of, of issues, but for the most part, we tend to keep this as sort of a kickoff point, give you a chance to ask questions. Not all of the senior managers here you see on a regular basis here in the chamber, so it's a chance for you to converse with them. And every year I say the same thing. They've each prepared a few brief remarks, and then one of them fails to be brief, and then we get to tease them for a year. So we'll see who gets that lucky award this year. 
Uh, this overall is very motley cruel. I think a PowerPoint <laughs> the pressure is on. Um, so we'll bookend it with administrators this year. So I'm going to let your city clerk, Jamie Carrillo, kick us off. I'll probably finish and we'll cover the rest of the areas in between. Jamie, you're on. Okay, good evening. Um, so I'm going to make this fairly short and sweet. I'm not going to pull a chief shirts and stand up here for 24 minutes. <laughs> chief, we all know that everyone loves the fire department. We did not need you to spend 24 minutes telling us that last year. <laughs> oh, the gauntlet's been thrown, wow. <laughs> Thanks for the <laughs> So this year, um, the city clerk's office, which now includes um, administrative assistant Drew Bendixson um, and myself, we decided to go big with everything that we did. Um, we didn't scan just one or two boxes of documents. We prepared and sent out 146 boxes for scanning into our electronic management system and scanned about a dozen more boxes in-house. We didn't just update one section of the municipal code. We redid them all and brought a 550-page ordinance to council last October. Um, we didn't just leave the city's contract process in place. We worked um, very closely with the Department of Public Works to scan and label every city contract and created a pretty impressive contract spreadsheet. Um, all information regarding active and expired contracts from the amount the contract was to the business license to the insurance certificate is all now at a click of a button. And finally, we spent way too many hours reading through way too many staff reports as we prepped packets for council. Um, Julian actually had some good advice for Neil on this topic. I said, hey, Julian, can you help Neil get his staff report in on time? <laughs> Julian's advice, tell Neil to stop writing 40-page staff reports. <laughs> so take note, Neil, make our life a little easier next year. <laughs> Jamie, this is being televised. You do know that. Uh, yeah. But in all serious, during the next fiscal year, the big goal is to have um, us finish the scanning of all building and planning and public works files. Um, and I'm proud to say that I think we're um, well on our way to doing that. Um, we have 12 more boxes that are going out for scanning next month for the Department of Public Works. Um, and as a reminder to both you and the public, um, next year the city clerk's office will also be coordinating and next fiscal year, the city clerk's office will also be coordinating um, with the county to hold a November 2019 election. So looking forward to another year. You already received the, the award for the most compelling presentation of the evening. <laughs> thank you, can, Jamie. Can we ask any questions? Sure thank, you for, can. thank you for keeping us so organized. Yes. Yeah. So Jamie, uh, we've transitioned to, most of us have transitioned to paper not paper, but online things. Are you finding that that's making um, organizing your process a little easier for us? Um, related to just council packets, yeah. or is it? Are you doing uh, online for all the other committees, or no, just 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 for just council? council. Um, it's a huge help. Um, it just reduces the amount of time it takes. Um, it's so much easier now for us all to review mm -hmm. the material and quickly put it together with a click of a button um, rather than you know printing hundreds and hundreds of pages like yeah. we're done. With. Do you think we can get some of the other commissions and, and other council, other um, boards to do online also maybe this year? I would be happy to, to look into that. That'd be good. I just think or can we make them? Can we make them? <laughs> I guess we could. Yeah. Well, buy yeah. a laptop for them if they don't have yeah. them. Yeah, uh, we had talked about that before. Yeah. It was, uh, there would just be standard issue things you kind of rotate around, you know, as people come on and off to commissions, but it was reduction of all the staff time and, and the paper. Right. That might be something to look at. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dan, are you going to continue choosing? Uh, but, but I have just one. Between uh, Chief Schertz and, and Director uh, Toft, which do you like the least? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they are both my favorite department heads. Uh, well, since Jamie didn't take any shots at community services, why don't we let our two community services departments talk now while the others prepare their retorts for their opportunity? <laughs> So how about Janice, why don't you uh, tell us about the library? Thank you. 
I asked Jamie uh, for some advice. She said, keep it to under five minutes. Now I know why. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to have this time and to tell you a little bit about what's going on with the library. Uh, some of you may know some of these things and hopefully there will be a new, few new things for you to learn about what we're doing as well. But before I begin, I'd really like to thank you all uh, as a council for your support for the library. Um, we know that you're there and you appreciate us and that you're saying kind things about us in the community and we value your help and support. I'd also like to thank Dan who puts up with our weekly conversations of which I usually regale him about something that I want. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, this last year we had a really good year. I feel very good about the library. I think we're much more vibrant uh, than we were the previous year. Certainly there's a different energy and a different feel when you go in there and we are booming in terms of our usage. Um, in fact, I recently asked Dan if we could do programs on Sundays. So um, you can see that we're, we're really working well down there. But just briefly, some things that we've done this year, we were lucky enough with uh, all of your help and support to add a new professional position to the library and that's an electronic services librarian. And that means somebody who is there to help uh, all of our patrons uh, navigate new systems, new, te new technologies, new uh, programs that we run. She's been a wonderful addition to the staff and is a good forward thinking position for us to have. She not only uh, works in the library, she's going to the TAM as well and other outreach places to uh, assist other people in the community with their electronic needs. So that's been a really good addition and we thank you for that. Uh, along with that, the other staff uh, uh, development that we've had, we've been able over the last year to gain a number of grants which has allowed us to send staff out for training or on various courses or in particular I'm proud of uh, a big grant that we got to help train the staff deal with mentally uh, challenged patrons which is becoming quite an issue and also with anti-violence training. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody thinks libraries are fairly quiet and benign but unfortunately they're not and there are a lot of um, incidents of violence and a couple of deaths um, recently in public libraries with library staff by patients who, uh, patrons who have, uh, are a little unhinged. So it's good to be able to have them go and have that training, give some confidence too that they uh, also can do something to help themselves. In terms of the library itself, we had increased usage both in terms of uh, the services that we provide, the number of attendees that came into the library, one of the things I think is quite important that you might like to know about is that in our little library downstairs last year we loaned out over 42,000 books which means or DVDs you know some of them obviously would have to go out more than once and we loaned in 20,000 so that's 62,000 items that came or went in that little room that you walk past every day, a truck comes and delivers all of those items that get processed. So that's really quite astounding for us. We're very pleased with that. Um, we produced over 281 programs, 171 for children with 10,253 attendees, which came to a 68.2% increase over the previous year. This year thus far, and in the first six months of this fiscal year, we're, we're well ahead of that. Um, I think we'll get close to 400 programs this fiscal year coming up. Um, and looking at our attendance records, we'll probably have about, I estimate, about 16,000 attendees. We're bursting at the seams, but I think that for you as council uh, members, We'd really like to point out how much we need a new library and a new facility because we're busting out all over. Some days we have multiple programs. This last Saturday, for example, we had three programs back to back in this room, um, which was a bit of maneuvering to go, but all of our programs are well attended and we're trying now to get an inspection across uh, the community from old folk to you know, down to our babies. 
and uh, it's going very well, as you probably know. So I've given you a copy of our current brochure, which we keep on developing and try to add more value to it each time we put it out for our community, and we're getting good feedback on that. The other things that we've done, we're trying to out, uh, extend our outreach uh, at the TAM now. Not only are we giving TED Talks, we are giving, continuing the weekly book exchanges. We're doing bi-weekly tech classes up there because a lot of the elderly residents are struggling with technology and they probably get a Kindle or an iPad or something from a relative and away, you know, they're, they're lost. So we're up there every other week giving one-on-one -on -one instruction with them. We also started a monthly book club up there. We're working with Marin Villages uh, and trying to get some um, more senior programming in here. We have a Medicare program next week. We have some wellness programs coming up for them. So we're trying to balance things out. We're doing more work in schools, lucky when some of the staff, for example, went down to Neil Cummins and participated in the readathon they recently had down there. Uh, we're expanding community outreach. We did our Food for Finds again this December, and along with the firemen, we participated in the Toys for Tots, which we'll continue to do. Uh, we're very grateful for the friends of the library who are very vigorous and vibrant. This last year, they gave us uh, over $18,000 in total. They also purchased us uh, five Chromebooks and some iPads, um, and Roku sticks and various things like this, which you can either borrow and use inside the library, or you can, uh, in some instances, we're having a limited, you can take things home. Um, and we're going to see how that goes. But it's a move to go away from fixed technologies to be able to offering services for people uh, who come into the library and may not have a device of their own. And we've added lots of digital resources, canopies, streaming services, another service called Digital Learn, which helps you learn all sorts of new tools and things. Um, we secured, with uh, Dan's help, match programming funds, um, and we're awf awfully grateful for that. We know this year we'll go over uh, the budget, which was 10000 from the city and 10000 from the friends. Um, the friends will help us pick up some of that difference. But... Indeed, our programming is going really well. So we, we're moving flat stick on all fronts and uh, getting good feedback from the community and uh, feel very blessed to be here in Larkspur for that. Briefly, just some goals coming forward. We are uh, in the process of, of working through the paperwork to recarpet the library. So we'll be closed for a few days while that happens. And that's thanks to... Uh, Mr. Zimmer, and a little from the city as well. So that'll be a good thing for us to do. That carpet can't wait another four or five years. So we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, other than that, we're looking to create a long-term strategic plan for the library because I know things will change in the future, but we can at least make a five-year plan and know that this is really what we're doing and not quite so randomly um, as we are now. So we'll develop that. We want to continue the community partnerships and outreach, and we want to continue to upgrade to 21st century technologies. And we look forward to working with the LLC on uh, helping them with the new library. And we also look forward to working with the friends and the foundation. And we're very grateful to for you for appointing an extra person to the, or a new person to the board of trustees to take over from Noel. And they're a great board, and I'm sure you'll hear from them as the year goes by. So that's the library. And on the back, there are a few little pictures, all taken um, very recently in the last two or three months of some of the things that we've done, so you can have a visual impression. Janice, do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> We're so blessed to have you. <laughs> wow. No, Pretty it, impressive. It's doing very well. Yes, and thank it is. you all for your help and your support. Well, thank you. Yeah. You've got a great okay. reputation. Any any. Anything? Any questions from the council members? Dan? Be between Chief Schertz and Director Toff, whom do you like the least? Sure, wait, wait. I, I, I just want to ex express my own appreciation, Janice, to you for everything you do for oh, this community. You, and um, 
you know, we're going through this process with the LLCC, yeah. and hopefully that will lead to good, good things in the future. I want to make sure you, you are comfortable that you're, uh, the input that you've been providing to that effort is being oh, taken into account as thank we you. move forward with that process. Thank you. Because uh, you're, you're a genuine asset to our community. Well, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank and you. And Janice, you helped with the task force putting together the friends. You got that. Uh, you, yes. We call them our fearless friends. <laughs> And yes, they are. <laughs> they are, indeed. <laughs> thank you, Janice. Okay, thank you very much. And who is next? That will be Mr. Whitley. Oh, ho, ho, ho. where's your skirt? <laughs> I'm not wet enough tonight. I'm oh. sorry, a formal occasion. You have such cute legs. <laughs> no, it's only a skirt if I'm wearing heels with it. That's only the holiday party. Okay. I don't know why everybody's so terrified of slides and, and a PowerPoint presentation. I only have about 143 or four. Um, won't keep you long. It's going to be fine. How do you work this thing? Um, all right, good. That's super. Madam Mayor, good evening. Members of the council, thank you for uh, having me in, as it were. This is uh, a little bit of the year up to now and a little bit of what we're looking forward to down in the recreation department. First things first, um, I've got two gentlemen who work down in that office with me. Nick Stone is the recreation supervisor, and Drew Bendixson I share half time with, uh, with our city clerk. And the two of them are pretty much an unstoppable force. So it's, it's, it's been a delight. I appreciate your, your creating that position for Mr. Bendixson so that he's able to be here full time, half time with the, uh, the clerk, and half time with us. He's been a tremendous asset. He's coming up on his one-year anniversary, so we're not going to be able to hold the probation mallet over his head much longer. And and it's the arrow, right? It's on. I didn't. I did. Dang, nab it. Janice, he needs your okay. training in the I digital need. department. See? See, I'm surrounded by quality people who know what they're doing, which means that I don't have to know everything or much in that case. Last June, last September, we had movies and music in the park, Piper Park. Do you love my slide? Do you love how it's all pushed together? Yeah. Um, that's, that's Nick Stone getting ready to put on a flick for about 250 people in the park. We had one music event. We had one movie event. This year, we're upping it. We're going to have three music events in Piper Park. They're going to be in the picnic area this time, not on the, uh, not on the softball diamond. It's really hot and lacking shade. But we've, uh, we've had a lot of um, help putting those things on, so appreciation to Nick and all the folks who have helped us put those things on. Here you go, ready? <laughs> okay, there it is. A, um, the super cool summer school happened to be on the Hall Middle School campus, and they were ready to use the gymnasium during that time. Summer school ended mid-July. The kids for Hall Middle School were due back in the middle of August. During that one month stretch of time, the floor was stripped, restriped and uh, resurfaced, and we've had a lot of very positive comments. So um, we, we split the difference with the, the school district. It was a joint expense for a joint facility, and um, it turned out extremely well, as you can see from these photographs. One week ago, I was driving a forklift, and I was carrying around 20 brand new concrete tables. Thank you, Julian. <clears throat> Nobody on the public works department pushed me off of the forklift. They said I could use it, and I was very appreciative to them for that. The Larkspur Community Association Foundation, thank you, Larkspur Community Foundation, I was going to mess that up. They purchased a table. They offset the, the cost of this to the city by about $2,000. They have contributed to the park in more ways than I think many people know. They've purchased a brand new water fountain for the park area. They contributed to the, the, uh, the presentation of the movie last summer. They're presenting again. They may be music and movie this summer. So um, our appreciation goes out to the Larkspur Community Foundation. In addition to that, the Public Works Department is, um, well, I appreciate Julia, Julian not minding too much when I hijack pretty much his whole department and take it for my own uses. Um, we've got Bob, Bob uh, Quinn, who is the superintendent, Tony, Noel, Gerardo, Eric and Carlos are all the gentlemen in the maintenance department. 
this wouldn't have happened without them either because we were all out there pushing things around, making sure that the, the, public, the public works department made sure that all the tables ended up where they were supposed to be. And from the engineering department, Rita Schock, who has been instrumental in getting lots of improvements, repair, rehab, or replace, um, Rita's the person who puts these things together. And my job would be much more difficult without her. So thanks to Rita and thank you again to Julian. We were also able to resurface the courts at Piper Park. Um, that again was due to uh, Rita uh, getting together new fencing and the resurfacing project that happened in August and September this past year. I'm going to beg the indulgence of the council for just a moment while I walk over here. This is fiscal year 1718. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming by. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling very pretty about it. The mayor has seen this particular video before. I believe she, she made sure that we had it. Um, but this was a picture, oh really? Man, that's a total fail. Um, that the, uh, the neighbor across the street, across the creek from Piper Park took this video. And there it is. This is the flashlight egg hunt from across the creek. It is chaos, it's absolute chaos. And we are looking tremendously forward to providing a third night of chaos. Use the mic, please. I'm sorry, of course. <laughs> I'm just having a great time. We're looking forward to a third night of chaos in three years this coming Friday. So if you want to see this live, please come down to Piper Park because at 8.30 at night, we're going to have about 250 or 300 kids searching in the dark for 3,000 eggs. What could possibly go wrong? Um, this is also one of Nick Stone's um, programs and he's done a, a really magnificent job with that. So if you are in the neighborhood, please come down, bike down or walk down because we're going to have a very full parking lot. But we'd, we'd love to see you there. Super Cool Summer School, which is hiding behind the first uh, picture there, is, uh, is a very large program. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, but we serve about 900 kids during the course of four weeks. This is not just beat on each other with foam sticks. This is a, a program called Bella Garth. And kids are taught uh, use of shields, use of swords. And it's really kind of fun to watch them go and, and have a great time. This young lady to the right is part of our Kung Fu class. And um, I'm not sure who she was set to wail on, but she was going to do it in a big hurry. We have a multi-sports program. We have a Lego, which also doubles as a stick out your tongue class. We have archery. No siblings were hurt by any other siblings with bows and arrows. We have henna which is intro to tattoo basically, but we had a good time with that. The henna does come off. We have um, bugs, bugs, bugs. We have soccer, we have tennis. Um, and we're really very happy with the, the folks at our summer school, the, the folks who present it, Beth Cease and Aaron Duggan, put on this program every year and it's madness start to finish, but they handle it, they maintain their dignity, and they're able to talk with people without shrieking too much. And I think that's really a, a very positive aspect of, of what they do. I've gotten ahead of myself yet again. There we are. Very quickly, some ongoing programs. I'm taking far less time than other people in this queue. The community garden has been around for 37 years. The Children's Center since 1975 is 44 years old. After school programs at Basich, Kent, and Hall schools our Larks for Larks seniors group, um, we, had, we restarted that after a short hiatus and we're, we're building that as well. We have an egg hunt every year that we pass back and forth to Corte Madera. They have it this year, we just have the flashlight egg hunt. The Larks for Walkers whom you honored just less than two years ago have been around for 32 years, courtesy of Nancy Spivey, our former director. And Rec Inc, which is a program that serves adults with developmental disabilities. They have seven programs that they run through our offices on a regular basis. And it, it's amazing to see these things happen. The Twin Cities Children's Center, they've been giving back to Larkspur and Cord Madera for years and years and years. And Sandy Petro, Trisha, Jay, Annie, Jenny, Jan, and Sandra are the staff that just keep providing new and different things all the time to our, our residents of uh, the Twin Cities. So, uh, we appreciate them very, very much. And I want to talk very briefly about the Rec Inc. programs, the Developmental Disabled. 
Basketball is one of them. They've got wiffle ball. They have a be healthy class, which teaches them nutrition, how to eat, be a little more self-sufficient. This past year, they came up with a prom. And the prom was, there's a backdrop and people dress up and they've got the sashes and it's a treat. It really is a good time because these folks come out of their shells. They're able to, to come into an, uh, an arena that, that they appreciate, that they're able to feel comfortable in, and the staff make them feel that way. In addition, I wanted to show you this slide on the right-hand side. You notice the young people pretty much taking over the, the dance floor. This is a group of mostly Marin Catholic and Redwood students who are volunteers, and they come to every third Friday dance at the Hall Middle School gym. There are 40 of them. We average 40 kids every night. And these are not necessarily special dances, not the Christmas dance or the St. Patrick's or Valentine's Day dance. It's every month. They show up of their own volition. They're increasing their leadership skills. They're giving back to the community. And we've had a presentation at the Park and Recreation Commission where two of the students came and spoke to our commission about their experiences. And they spoke about the fact that they looked at these adults with developmental disabilities pretty much askance at the start and have gotten to know them as real people and really take pride and ownership in getting the clients as they're referred to out on the dance floor and having a good time. So it's, it's giving back to the community. We have adult volunteers and this program serves a whole lot of people community wide. Uh, I didn't turn that off, did I? <laughs> Dang, nab it, there we are. Okay, feeling better, feeling better. Goals. Um, the gentleman in the blue shirt on the left-hand side is Brett, Brett Geithman. You may know him from the Larkspur Court of Madera School District. Uh, he is about 10 feet away from my window is where his office is. He shut his shades most of the time, but that's another story. But Brett has been an amazing partner to us. We need things from him. He needs things from us. And it's a nice back and forth. It's a joint facilities that we use. And it's, it's really been a, a very good relationship for a lot of time, actually going back 25 years that I've been here. But Brett came in um, about two years ago and has continued that relationship going forward. Another goal is to continue to work, continue to work with the DPW staff, and they're all excellent chefs, so we just have them cook for us, and that works out pretty well. Actually, this was a celebration of them this past week um, with all the hard work that they've been doing for us all year. Um, so we cooked for them, and they didn't complain too much, which we really appreciate. A goal to continue to improve the utilization of our facilities. We're pretty much rented out on a lot of these things, but um, we're working on trying to increase the dollars coming in the door. And finally, to work uh, to improve the ease of use and intuitive flow of our particular website. Um, Nick and Drew know what a computer is, unlike myself. I'm still using the Abacus. But they know their way in and around, and they're doing a great job of bringing this thing forward and making it a much easier um, opportunity for people to use for all their uh, recreation needs. Finally, I'm happy to entertain any questions with only having turned it off once. I'm very proud. Dick, thanks for making Larkspur so much fun. Thank you. Yes. Any questions from the council, Dan? Hello? Could you go back a couple of slides? I'm not sure I know how to do that. <laughs> no, just a few, just a Any few. Any particular slide keep going, you're keep interested going, in? Keep going, keep going, keep going. That one, that one, that one. That one, that one. Wait, wait, wait. This one. Yeah, that one. There we are. Yes, sir. Now, first, I thought there was some stuff on my glasses. And then I saw there was like water spots on the no. slide. No. The only other comment I have is when you put the images there. Yes, sir. And you see how you've got some of them, they got round corners yes. and square. Yes. Could you pick one or the other to have does them? That, like... Does that trouble you? <laughs> that, did that send an eye into, into shaking? Did it? And this is, this is glimmer. That's glow, sunshine off the floor. I like that part. But just the, 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 cro the cropping. It's the new way of looking at it. I can't get past the cropping. This is the abacus view. <laughs> You're biting into his time now. Jamie's keeping yeah. track. It's yeah. not my fault. This is question time. I'm off the clock. Excellent. Yeah. Other excellent content. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, and also pickleball. You forgot to mention pickleball. I did neglect to mention pickleball. Yeah, I didn't have that opportunity. To, it's not one of our long-standing 30-plus year programs, but we do for, have pickleball. Thanks for doing that. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Nice job. Thank you. Okay. Next. <laughs> Before we move on, Madam Mayor, if I could for a second offer a, a boring but important point about 
the photo in the bottom left. Uh, you know, here we are in a year where we're launching a $25 million paving program and uh, th we're in the midst of a $30 million bridge rebuild. If someone wanted to learn a lesson in municipal budgeting and financing for the past fiscal year, probably the best story they could learn about is the evolution of the picnic tables. Mm. Even though it's a little thing, um, it was not in the budget wasn't programmed, it was something that we aspired to do. Uh, the recreation staff did a detailed analysis of the revenue potential of renting the picnic tables if they were improved, went through the process of presenting that to me, went through the process of presenting it to the Park and Rec Commission, and then uh, Dick did what department heads do, he had to negotiate with other department heads to figure out how to get that expenditure into the budget by prioritizing it and moving some other projects that could be shifted to a subsequent fiscal year. Um, and so, while I, appre I appreciate the long-winded, light-hearted uh, presentation, good job, Dick. Um, I do feel a need to be a little serious and compliment Dick that that we, uh, we don't want to lose sight of. Those little things count, and the community's going to benefit from these picnic tables uh, considerably. It's a much, uh, a much improved area if you've had a chance to go out and see what's been done. Um, but it's not a little exercise to get a five-figure unbudgeted expense into the budget mid-year. So they're to be complimented for that. Dick, you're and amazing. I'll use it as a segue to call upon our representatives of Public Works because they had to be flexible too in that very project, both to uh, work with the CIP amendments that need to take place and then put the tables in. Although, as risk manager, I didn't really want to know that Dick might have been the one driving the forklift. So how about Julian and Bob, why don't you guys come on up? We, I mean, uh, humor aside, we don't take any of this for granted. We know how hard you all work. And very much appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council, Julian Skinner, Public Works Director. Not crazy about going after uh, Mr. Whitley and his great presentation about all of the uh, classes and great things they're doing over at uh, Parks and Rec. I'm sure in next year's presentation we'll see uh, all about your great PowerPoint classes you're going to be giving this year over at Parks and Rec. Great. Um, so I'm going to start out with the administration and engineering half of Public Works and then um, I'll let Bob Quinn, the maintenance superintendent, uh, step up and talk a little bit about uh, parks and streets. Um, so there's two main components to the uh, engineering division um, in Public Works. There's our mandated core services where we touch base with the public and this is uh, public service requests, um, encroachment permits, um, and then when we take part in the review of uh, projects that typically come in through a, a planning process. Um, and so for public uh, service requests, we take phone calls, emails, there's um, a widget um, on the city website where people can log in uh, and send their requests. And this is everything from uh, a pothole on your street, something where you know something needs to be fixed and you just uh, send us a note and say, can you please fix this? to more complex questions such as why is there a traffic signal at this intersection and not one at that one. We take all of those in and uh, Scott Metcho uh, in our office processes all of those, feeds uh, through them and decides which ones go to Bob for action and which ones come uh, to engineering for uh, further analysis. Um, and then the other half of uh, what we do over in engineering is the capital improvement program. So. Uh, when we come back before you on May 15th, I think, is when you're going to see the Public Works presentations. You're going to see um, a Public Works uh, administrative budget uh, that talks about the, the first things I just mentioned. And then also you're going to see the capital uh, program budget, which is for what we term as projects. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments from this last year from some of the bigger projects. Um, and then Bob will talk about some of the smaller projects and the more routine things that he takes care of out of his um, operating budget. And so I think the biggest, as uh, city manager mentioned, we have two pretty significant capital projects that are underway at the moment. We have the Bonaire Bridge, uh, which is close to a $30 million project. Uh, just the real construction just started this fiscal year. Uh, it's anticipated to be a four-year project. 
Um, and so uh, the majority of the work that was done this past fiscal year was the substructure on the north side of the bridge. So as folks remember, we're actually building the bridge in two halves so we can keep traffic going over it. And so most of the work that's taken place to date has not been seen, but I guarantee you there are four large piles, eight a foot in diameter in the creek um, that we've paid a lot of money for. Um, and as you see in the coming months, now that we've got through our environmental permit windows, the contractor's back out there and you'll start to see the bridge come out of the water. You'll start to see uh, the extension of those four columns on the north side come up um, and then they'll get wider. Those are called bent caps. And then towards the end of the summer, you'll see them bring in the big prefabricated concrete girders that then they'll pour the deck um, across. And then hopefully, this time next year, uh, you'll see them having finished that north side of the bridge and we'll start to shift traffic over. And then we'll do all of that whole process again on the south side. So in the water for a year and then the superstructure of the bridge for the year after that. Uh, the other thing was the paving program. So this last year, we just finished the last of our Measure C funded paving projects. So this is work in the Riviera Circle, Palm Hill and uh, Murray Avenue areas. And so uh, we transitioned this year into our Measure B program. So we finished the construction for last year's project was funded by Measure C. And then this year with the Measure uh, B funds, we're going to be paving the next group of streets. Um, and we started this year, we did the design for those streets and compliments to our uh, engineer, Alvin Tan, who worked with a consultant. This project was three times as big as uh, any paving project we've done before. And he worked with a consultant to get us out to bid earlier than we have in any previous year with our paving projects, which we really needed. And I think that's one of the reasons why we got such good construction bids and we had a lot of interest. We had four contractors bid on the paving project this year. Uh, so we're looking forward uh, to that project in the coming year. Um, we also uh, completed an ADA analysis for all of these streets that need to be paved or are triggers, uh, federally mandated Americans with Disabilities access improvements that need to be made. So we uh, finished that analysis and that's something we'll be moving forward with the construction in the coming fiscal year. Uh, we also had to do a mandated analysis of our pavement. So every two years, uh, consultants come and uh, walk all of our streets and rate our pavement and uh, with the investment that we've had with Measure C and moving forward with Measure uh, B, we've seen that rating is going up. We're still in the bottom. We've got a lot of ways to go, uh, but we're hoping to see that number keep rising uh, over the years. Um, and then we uh, completed the uh, repair of a slide that we had two winters ago in Villa La Cumbre, and we've been working with FEMA to get reimbursed uh, for that over the last fiscal year. Um, and then a couple of park projects that Dick already stole my thunder on, as he mentioned, Rita Shock has been uh, working on some improvements in Piper Park. And then also uh, the folks out at, I think it's Maximus uh, Realty that run the uh, Serenity Apartments uh, have been paying for improvements out at Neighborhood Park and that's underway and they're about halfway through those improvements now um, out off of uh, Lincoln Village Circle. Uh, so moving forward to this year, as I mentioned, a lot of it's just continuation of what we're doing. We're looking forward to getting the rest of the north half of the bridge, Bonaire Bridge, uh, finished and opened. Uh, we just started this week. The contractor, as Gelati Brothers, uh, got our uh, Group 1 paving project. They've been out in uh, the Greenbrae Hills. They'll be there for about a month and a half, and then they're going to move over to the Madrone um, and Wilson Way. Um, areas. Uh, check out the Fixing Our Roads uh, link on the city website. We'll be putting uh, schedules up there. And then just to let everybody, all the public know that the uh, contractor is required to send out notices uh, that have the actual paving dates. A lot of this stuff changes day to day and so we have the best information we can up on our website, but look out for the mailers that you'll get from the contractor that will have specific dates on it, as well as the uh, parking signs um, that are placed out on the street that have the actual dates for when uh, you can't park in the street. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll be doing all the curb ramps, too, uh, this summer and through before next year's paving project. Um, and then we've actually already started work on the design for next year's uh, paving project. So as part of getting this project out early and getting those good bids, uh, as soon as we start construction on this year's project, we're already doing the design for next year's. Uh, so that's taking place now. And then we're working with the residents out at the uh, Larkspur Marina to replace uh, part of their lagoon system there. They have an outlet pipe that's failed, and so that's taking a lot of uh, Bob's time with manual maintenance. And so we're working with them to put a system in that's more passive and will make Bob's life um, a little easier. And then going back to the bridge, as, as you may remember, there's five mitigation projects that were triggered by the environmental permits for that. We've uh, kick-started that uh, 
process again, and we're working with a consultant to finalize those designs and get those projects out to, to bid. So those are some good improvements for us. They fix a couple of our docks, get a new dog park. Uh, the old dog park gets restored to tidal marshlands, and then we're doing some stormwater quality improvements on uh, Magnolia. So we're hoping to get that out to bid later uh, this summer and then for construction next year. And then we have a number of other smaller CIP projects that will go into more detail uh, when we have our presentation um, on the 15th. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Bob, unless you want to do questions first. Julian, I just want to say it's pretty amazing. We, we all know how the details, <coughs> how involved all these projects are, and you make it seem so easy. You are Thank so well organized. So thanks for keeping Larkspur so safe and continuation on, on upscaling all the infrastructure. Kevin? Just, just wanted to ask a question, and again, I just reiterate uh, the mayor's comments. Uh, uh, the work that you guys do is just terrific, and you know you're juggling several major projects right now and getting them done. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the paving project and on scheduling issues, since I saw a big electronic sign that pop up in front of my house this past right. couple of days. <laughs> With uh, with it, uh, an overall time frame, which I think right. is from like now through uh, August, and we've been getting the mailers from Gelati Brothers, okay. um, basically saying you know they'll give us 72 hours notice before they are actually out in front of the house doing the paving project. Yeah, so there's a lot of components to the work. You may see them out on your street now. They have to, there's some preparatory work they have to do before they actually pave the street. For instance, all of the manholes yeah. and structures right. have to be lowered down so that when they come through and repair the road, they don't damage them. So you'll right. see them out and about doing certain things before they actually come and pave. The most impactful work will be the day when they come and grind and lay the asphalt. Right. That's when they'll put the no parking signs, but you'll see them you know, on the street on and off for a couple of weeks, probably before they actually come through and do the grind and pave. And that's the one where they really need to give you the notification because right. that's the day where the no parking signs come up. And if there's a car in the way, they'll do everything they can to try and find the owner. But if worse comes to worse, the cars will be towed. Yeah, no, I understand that. And I've actually also seen PG&E out, uh, out on the street. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but I think they're doing some line work. Uh, for some of the houses on on our street, at least. So, hopefully, everyone's talking to each other and making sure they're not getting in the, each other's way as this work moves forward. Um, the only concern that I have is, uh, I, uh, you know, just because of the constraints on ingress and egress in those neighborhoods in in Greenbrae, um, uh, I, I do worry a little bit with that 72-hour notice period that some people are going to be cut off guard. Uh, if they're on vacation or they're away and they're not paying attention to what's going on, that all of a sudden they're going to find um, themselves in a situation where they can't get out of their neighborhood, and we're going to hear about that. So anything that you can do to work with Gelati Brothers and the other contractors that are involved in this process to make sure that you know the, the prior notification is given to folks so that they can plan um, and make preparations for example, uh, I'm not sure where folks are going to park their cars. Um, I know where I'm going to park my car, which is just down the street in an un un unincorporated Marin, which is easy access to me. But for some of the folks who live further up in the hills, I'm not sure that they've thought that through. So the more we can do to educate people um, and well in advance of when these things are going to happen so that they can plan on where they're going to park and how they're going to get in and out, would be really appreciated. Okay, understood. Any other questions? Larry? Now that we know the clapper rail is gone, <laughs> um, how, how much time will uh, you think you could get back from that in terms of your project schedule? Um, it's hard to say definitively. There are a lot of other pieces that are interrelated, but just uh, for comparison, last year, the clearance that we just got two weeks ago, we didn't get um, until July. So um, the contractor has many variations of his schedule depending on what shows up and, and, and what doesn't. It's not just the, uh, the clapper rail. There are other environmental constraints out there um, that are unknown. But as a overall, the only comparison I have is what happened last year. And last year it was July before we got that. So uh, definitely a, a good thing for the schedule wise. Uh, what we're looking at now on the schedule is um, there is a closure that's in the project. 
uh, when the girders have to go on. And so now that we got the clapper rail um, clearance early, we're trying to see if we can't move that uh, road closure up so it's not as impactful. So that's one of the things we're w focusing on now with the contractor as far as the, the schedule goes. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Julian. Okay. Hi, Thank Bob. You. Hello. Favorite day of the year. I, oh, anyway, I, what did you, you say? I said my favorite day of the year. Oh. My one council meeting I get to attend. <laughs> um, anyway, as you know, our maintenance division and public works we're pretty much divided between parks and uh, we streets, but it's streets and facilities. And this building takes up a lot of our time. Um, major uh, things that we completed last year in parks. Um, well, we did all of our normal annual maintenance and our tree pruning um, <coughs> through a, great, now I'm going to lose my voice. Anyway, <coughs> through a Rita Shock's help, as you've heard, um, she she works for a lot, of, works with a lot of us. Um, she has a donation program for benches, for um, picnic tables and trees throughout the city. And last year, in her program she was able to put in 13 new benches two picnic tables and two trees um, we've performed uh, major maintenance on the softball f infields over at Piper Park last year and we're going to try to do some more this year uh, we use some extra budget funds to um, plant trees to replay in uh, the parks to replace ones we lost in the storms two years ago um, yeah just the usual uh, my major goals uh, for uh, this year in parks is to improve our routine maintenance schedule. We are still um, just chasing complaints, and we're trying to get out of doing that. Um, to continue improvements and repairs on the infrastructure, and you've seen a lot of progress has been made on that already this year. Um, I've got irrigation things that I want to continue to work on. and. Um, working together with the school district through our uh, integrated pest management programs to try to come up with better ways to control the weeds and uh, issue the tur keep the turf happy that we have. Um, that will end up coming to you eventually. <laughs> anyway, and in streets and facilities, um, as you know, we've got a few city buildings that we take care of, some pump stations, uh, the streets, the storm drain system, and all the street lights and traffic signals, and all the signs. Um, we completed emergency repairs this last year at the Redwood Marsh Outlet Gate, which is what helps keep Heatherwood's neighborhood from flooding. Um, we completed uh, emergency repairs and two collapsed storm drains under streets. We've uh, cleaned up a large homeless camp over above Tub Lake with the help of the police department. Uh, and a contractor that we hired to do that work um, and a lot of uh, coordination with the, uh, the garbage company because it's borders their property also and we have to use their property for access. Um, performed extensive pothole repairs and uh, patch paving through using engineering and some contractors we were able to actually patch pave and put a small overlay over a lot of these streets that are really bad to hold them until we can get to them in the paving program. And that keeps my staff from having to run all over creation, filling potholes. And the, the material I use is way more expensive than the hot asphalt we use with contractors. Um, did all of our annual, the annual painting and maintenance that we normally do in a year. Uh, we responded to this winter's rain events and uh, actually city did okay. Yeah, we did. We, uh, didn't have any major issues this year. Lost of lost some trees. We did a, quite a bit of tree removal. And um, let me see. Major goals: continue to develop a routine maintenance schedule for the city buildings. That's a big push this year, um, due to safety committee and just due to the fact that it needs to be done. And you're seeing some of the results. There's new exit lights and new emergency lights going up all over the building. There'll be other changes you'll notice. Um, we're continuing to assess and clean the storm drain system to prepare it for future storms. 
uh, and to make sure that it's it's intact before we go pave a new road over top of it. I'm one of my big goals this year is to develop a uh, scheduled uh, sign maintenance program. Something we don't have, so we just get to those as they get really bad. We're in the process now of trying to get them scheduled so that we can get them up to snuff and then keep them that way. And other than that, the same thing. Um, we a uh, compliant weed abatement program because currently our only option is to weed eat. That's that's not good enough. So. Um, any other questions? Well, I just have to say, you said <clears throat> it's just the usual. Bob, you and your staff well, <laughs> keep us safe. And actually, I hear a lot of my colleagues, a lot of compliments. So thank you for well, working as diligently as you and your, your crew does. Well, thank you guys you. do an excellent job. Thank and you. I, and I, I know when people call in for potholes, I know that I guarantee them that it will be fixed within a week or so. And you're doing it. I'm like, I've got so. an excellent crew. And I get it more support than I've ever had anywhere from Julian, so. Yeah, great team. Yeah, any questions from the council? Only that cinematic doesn't even begin to capture the flow of images that we lose. Thank you. <laughs> nice yeah. job. After following him, <laughs> I'm done, one. you know. <laughs> Bob, I just had one. Do you, do yes, you keep a list of uh, projects that are available for like the Eagle Scout projects and things? Because it seems that those come up every once or twice a year, it seems That's like. Rita and um, Dick and I are, are trying to come up with something like that. We've been able to come up with little ones on yeah, this when we needed them. But we do need to develop something where we've got some things. I was just thinking about it because you said the sign project and there was one Eagle Scout who came and wanted to do something like refurbishing some of the signs and strikes me that it would be a really good opportunity if we could if you come across them to just sort of put down a few of these minor projects that can be handled by a, a community outreach scout or something some do you think that I mean you've done a few your son did one yeah, yeah, yeah. he did that deck by the tennis courts yeah right things that are in the parks are easier anything that's out in the street becomes oh, kind right. of a safety issue yeah and that's where all our most of most of the signage I take care of, that's where it is. Good point. Right. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>
And during that week in 2018, we visited 13 classrooms to teach basic childhood fire safety to 321 students in grades K through two. We ramped up our support of the ever-growing uh, Central Marin NRG program, which recently reached a membership of over 6,000 households. And I'd just like to take a second to acknowledge Lori Rice and all of the NRG leaders for the work that they have done to further develop and expand this program throughout the Central Marin area. I believe that this local program should become the model for community preparedness and resiliency. The ideas of family and property preparedness, collective neighborhood responsibility, neighbor helping neighbor, and most importantly, the benefits of neighbor knowing neighbor, communicating, prioritizing, problem solving together. The time to meet your neighbor is before an emergency, not during one. And this popular NRG program is really helping accomplish that critical component in the preparedness game plan. Uh, in terms of emergency preparedness, uh, our fire marshal conducted several community neighborhood walks to discuss how residents can uh, create proper defensible space around their homes and how to prepare a cr and create an action plan in the event they are required to evacuate due to a wildfire. One of our major goals in the coming year is to encourage and assist neighborhoods with attaining NFPA FireWise recognition. With that goal in mind, FireWise presentation, presentations were given to a number of NRG neighborhoods, including Meadowcrest, Hidden Valley, Upper Madrone, Lower Madrone, Olive, and Blue Rock. Our vision is to have as many neighborhoods as possible become recognized as FireWise communities. In terms of long-range planning, we've begun working with Todd Lando as a vegetation management specialist to assist with creating additional FireWise neighborhoods. Todd has a wealth of experience with the FireWise program, vegetation management, and grant writing. In fact, we just learned today that with Todd's assistance, we were successful in competing for a $1 million grant through CAL FIRE, which will be used for fuels reduction project along the primary and secondary evacuation routes on Christmas Tree Hill and in Madrone Canyon. Yeah, that's great. The grant will also be used to create a shaded fuel break stretching several miles between the watershed lands and the communities of Corte Madera and Larkspur. This work by itself will not completely solve our wildfire uh, preparation challenges, but it will significantly reduce the vulnerability of our hillside neighborhoods. Administratively, we launched our new website, centralmarinefire.org, and while it is still under construction and certainly a work in progress, we're happy with the design and think it will be a useful tool for the community to get relevant information and direction to appropriate resources. And we are just wrapping up our first official recruitment as Central Marin Fire. We plan to use this recruitment to fill a vacancy that was created by a retirement last April and to finally staff up the downtown Larkspur Fire Station with three personnel instead of two. This represents a significant improvement in both firefighter safety and customer service and it was one of our primary goals with the consolidation effort. And the last topic I want to talk about is working together with our neighbors. Combining the fire departments of Larkspur and Corte Madera has been a huge success from almost any perspective. The consolidation has increased our efficiency, staffing depth, prevention program, and our command and control capabilities. And while we're thrilled with the success of the new organization, we are not done looking for opportunities to enhance our operation or squeeze out some additional efficiencies. In November, we implemented a shared services agreement with the Kentfield Fire Protection District. And there are quite a few components to this new arrangement, but the highlights are, we are sharing our fire marshal and two battalion chiefs with Kentfield, and they are sharing their fire inspector and one battalion chief with us. In addition, we now have the ability to utilize staffing from either agency to fill mandatory staffing assignments, which really increases our flexibility and goes a long way toward maintaining positive morale. And the best part is that as a direct result of the efficiencies gained through this new partnership with Kentfield, we are finally able to achieve the three-person staffing on each fire engine in our response district. And as you all know, on the council, this has been a goal that goes back further than any of us who work or govern in this city. And we are excited to have accomplished it through the development of quality partnerships and some creative problem solving. 
What a great update. Some, That's fantastic. I'm ready for some questions. Yeah. Any questions for the council? No. That's a good update. It's a great update. That's it. Love the shared okay. services. Absolutely. Oh, we have a question. I walked by Station 14 yesterday and saw that um, uh, the training, the group training of extra extrication. Extra Diction, extrication extrication of um, from cars yes. and of what I one of the other things that I think is should be added to your talk is the ability to cross train now with with Kentfield because Kentfield was there and Corte Madera and Larkspur well now Central Marin were yes. all there which I thought really I've watched from afar but I thought that that really had the opportunity to enhance learning and training of all of our officers yeah it sure does I mean we've been uh, participating in a Central Marin training consortium mm -hmm. for five or six years now that um, includes Kent Field and San Rafael and Marinwood actually as oh. well but um, we're doing more and more kind of training within the valley and um, partnering our partnership with Kent Field has never been stronger good yeah good. That's great. And are you quite concerned with the incredible rain that we've had this winter? <laughs> Is that something that's on everyone's mind? You know, it's a classic. It's classic. Every year, it's going to be the worst fire season ever for various reasons. Either we're in a drought or yeah, we got typical. record rainfall, so now all the grass is growing more than yeah. usual. So, um, yes, we're concerned, but um, I think in the grand scheme of things, having the rain was beneficial yeah. rather and I than think all the, I think people are now, with all the fires that have occurred, yeah. Or more cautious yeah. Too. Well, the grass is going to be tall, and yeah. we're going to have to get it cut. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> As we so transition to Chief Norton and police, um, it was a heavy lift to get the fire department to where it is now, and I want to acknowledge the council's uh, willingness to increase the budget of the fire department to get us where we are today because we've already started to see the benefits in the community, the responsiveness to the enhanced services we're able to provide. Um, and now, as Mike gets ready to take the mic, the pressure's on Chief Shirts because now he has his full staff. He's accomplished the type of thing we think should happen when you have economies of scale, which is new partnerships with other entities. But he has a model to look to, and that's the police department, which for now going on th almost four decades, uh, you know, has used this idea of collaboration and economies of scale to find ways to flatten costs while other agencies are experiencing uh, increases. So um, I couldn't have teed it up better for you, Mike. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Chief Nort. <laughs> it's you again? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by just thanking Jamie and Scott for actually following directions and keeping it to roughly five minutes. And uh, <laughs> unlike everyone else we've heard from. And, um, <laughs> and in addition, Jamie's was actually entertaining and informative as well. Um, and to answer your future question, um, Council Member Helmer, with regards to Scott or Neil, um, I like them equally, which isn't very much. So. <laughs> So quickly, I'll try and do five minutes. How about we give it up for the stats one more time? Those are good stats, right? Absolutely. Come on. All right. I was proud of the stats. Um, big things is, as you know, we've had some staffing challenges in 2018. I did it by calendar years. We uh, recruited, interviewed, and conducted background investigation and hired and trained six police officers and four cadets. Those are our parking enforcement. So that was 10 employees. Um, we did lots of training with our sworn officers, including but not limited to use of force, pursuit policy, leadership development, crisis intervention, traffic investigations, communications, and supervisor responses to critical incidents. One thing we actually did, we started working actually nicely with our fire department in uh, both our fire departments in San Anselmo and Central Marin. Um, trying to refine our responses and having discussions about community notifications and possible large evacuations that would occur should we get a, a large wildland fire. Um, one thing I'm personally proud of, and um, Council Member, our Mayor Morrison helped me in the beginning with this, was our creation of our HOPE team, which is our Homeless Outreach Police Evaluator team. That was the team that worked with Public Works when they, um, oh, he left already. Um, when they cleared the homeless encampment off of uh, Tub Lake and in all our jurisdictions. Um, the big thing they do is they proactively reach out and provide homeless community with resources in the hope of providing 
possible future housing for them. We also expanded on our Narcan overdose program, which is people who overdose on heroin or fentanyl and trained everyone on how to use that. And another thing I'm proud of is we re-implemented with the help of um, Council Member Chu, our Explorer program, which had been dormant for at least five years, maybe eight years. So yeah, so we've got that back up and running. We got uh, a good group of, I think five or six right now. They all wanna be future police officers. So we're hoping to kind of help us out with some of our staffing down the road when they get a little older too. In terms of goals, um, we're gonna do an in-depth assessment over the next two years and kind of internally audit how we do business. Because one thing we found is we push our employees harder and harder to increase their stats and do more, be, be out there more and do more traffic enforcement, but they just don't have the time because of a lot of other duties we're having them do. And a lot of it is report writing and, and um, things like that that we don't, we're not necessarily have to do a lot of this is my thought. So we're gonna really look at it, be careful with it, but the goal is by doing these assessments and having some working groups is to free up their time to go be police officers and not um, typists essentially and get out there with the community doing enforcement, keeping them safe and all those good things. Um, that's our goal over the next two years. And hopefully um, with that, we'll have an increase even further in traffic enforcement. Another big thing we're gonna be doing this year is more special operations, which is hard. We kind of put them on the back burner a lot, but they're important and they do have a good impact. So we're gonna be doing more traffic special operations such as pedestrian strings, seatbelt stings, distracted driving. We're gonna be having our investigations do some more special operations to help deter car and um, crime and be in unmarked vehicles out in our shopping centers to help with the uh, auto burglaries we're facing. Um, we're gonna have special operations with our HOPE team to get out there they're actually starting already, even because the rain's starting, it's starting to warm up and we're, we're already kind of seeing people coming back into our, our wild areas in terms of trying to set up homes and give them those resources and get them in appropriate shelters. Um, we're in the process right now of getting an electronic citation system, which doesn't sound very exciting, but we still paper write all our citations, parking and tickets, and it's all gonna be through um, iPhones and little mini printers and it'll speed it up a lot which once again frees up their time and it's probably easier for our citizens as well. And finally, the big one is we're gonna be continue to recruit, interview, conduct background investigations and train new police officers and cadets to get us back up to full staffing. Okay. Great, wow. Any questions? Okay, Larry. Not a question, but comment um, and, and it's kind of a challenge to fire. Um, I, I mean, City manager had brought it up, and I think it's a good point for the public because uh, Central Marin Police, which has been around for almost 40 years, if we look back at the statistics we were given at one of our recent, uh, you know, police council meetings, over the 10-year period from 2006 to 2016, the um, Larkspur share of the budget only went up 1.4 percent. Okay, so we have keeping our expenses flat, but higher level of community service. And uh, I, I haven't normalized the figures, say, going out to 2018 because of the changes in the discount rate, but if you just look at that, that's a good 10-year comparison in terms of how shared services work. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Well, I guess we'll turn over to planning and building. Hello, Neil. Good evening, Mayor I know Mayor you'll be Morrison. five minutes. You're just going <clears> to... <throat> and <clears throat> and members of City Council. So, Scott, uh, one thing to know <laughs> is if getting heat from the city clerk is new to you, <laughs> welcome to my world. <laughs> no, really, turn on the <laughs> I will not, Neil. Okay, um, planning and building department. We're uh, planning division and building department. You know what we do. Um, I'm just quickly gonna go through a number of organizational changes we had and then some of the achievements from last year and our goals for this year. Um, as you're aware, we hired a second permit technician early last year, Jim Kerrigan. He and Natalie uh, manned the counter 
And um, they're really the public face, the interface for not just planning and building, but a lot of other departments, a lot of people come to the counter. Um, <clears throat> we're handling a lot of permits. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and a lot of those are uh, encroachment permits as well because of the paving project. Uh, we're seeing a real increase in um, uh, encroachments for sewer laterals and utilities as well. So uh, they've, they've been very busy. And uh, we also saw in the fall the retirement of our associate planner, Ana Camarada. Uh, rather than backfill that position, uh, we promoted uh, Nick Armour, our assistant planner to associate, expanded his hours, expanded his role. He's taking over zoning administrator duties and working on plan, uh, MCEP for climate change and the uh, climate action plan. Um, we've also expanded <clears throat> the role of the senior planner, Kristen Tyke, uh, her hours and her role. She's becoming more hands-on in terms of um, current planning operations and managing uh, the planning commission agendas in an attempt to free up my time for uh, certain other uh, projects that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, we're also, we've hired a part-time uh, consultant uh, company from Four Leaf, a consultant from Four Leaf Consulting uh, that is doing two days a week of code enforcement. And uh, that's beginning to show some uh, uh, results and um, and it's been helpful in getting the planning and building staff out of the distractions of sort of ad hoc code enforcement activities, things that they're really not professional. That's not really part of their day-to-day -day business and can be very uh, time consuming. So it's good to have someone who's focused on that and someone we can really point to uh, for those kind of questions. And we're also uh, we can utilize some on-call planning consultants if we get uh, a little bit of overload in terms of project work uh, as an as-needed basis. Uh, part of doing this, we're uh, reducing some of the planner's counter availability, really trying to get the public to focus on making appointments, uh, particularly for resubmitting for applications. Uh, we see that as a way of making things really run smoother for applicants too. Uh, and, and again, the two permit technicians have been helpful in really managing the counter uh, during our open times. Um, so some of our achievements in the building department, uh, we had 1,134 permits last year. Uh, that's well above the average, which is below, of the last several years, below 1,000. And again, about a third of those are encroachment permits or grading permits. Um, uh, we see these as an increase in smaller permits, not necessarily a lot of larger permits. Um, and uh, we're continuing on a similar pace right here into 2019. We issued permits for one accessory dwelling unit. That's really not enough. We did issue three new single family dwellings. You're gonna see the last of the Drake's Cove, ho Drake's Cove homes uh, go up uh, this summer. Uh, you'll see those on that hill um, at the end of the, as you're going out San Quentin. So that's gonna be the final Drake's, Drake's Cove Court homes. Um, we also issued the building permits for King Street housing, which was really a great accomplishment. Uh, there were fee waivers. I think that was a positive for the community. And, um, and I'd also note uh, our, our building consultants, plan check firm, Philip Seabrooks, they waived their fees for that project too. They didn't have to do that, but they, they did. Um, <clears throat> we also saw the city council adopt the EV permit, uh, streamlined permitting. Um, we've used that to be ready, the permit for uh, Tesla at the Bonaire Shopping Center uh, for EVs there. Uh, but that's to meet state law and to really encourage uh, more uh, EV charging throughout the community. Uh, in planning, we received 56 new applications this year. Uh, 16 of those carried over. Um, the commission approved 26 applications. It was not highly active this year, uh, but I would note no appeals to the city council. And in fact, it's we're almost going on almost two years now since we've had an appeal. Uh, zoning administrator approved 12 applications and then there were six other administrative type applications. Uh, the council also adopted an ordinance prohibiting illegal uh, advertising of illegal activities and uses, and that really is something that helps um, 
code enforcement, and we've already seen it uh, used in correcting some uh, short-term rental uh, violations at this point. Uh, the Heritage Board did not have a real busy year in terms of planning applications. They had one permit review, um, but they did provide consultation with Public Works on a sidewalk seating design at the Lark Theater, um, and they continued their community outreach and education. Uh, their primary accomplishment was completing a reevaluation of Baltimore Park and South Magnolia historic neighborhoods to um, work on completion of the um, uh, historic inventory update. So, uh, kind of transitioning to achievements and goals, uh, one of our biggest goals uh, in this upcoming year is uh, finalizing the general plan. Uh, throughout last year, we did uh, work with the steering committee, um, holding three workshops, uh, several study sessions, uh, so we knocked out a good portion of the uh, chapters and uh, we're getting those finalized. Uh, we still have work to do on finalizing the, some of the tougher loads in terms of the circulation element and land use element and finalizing all the maps. I'm working on getting that uh, to the steering committee and setting up dates over the next couple months and get this, uh, get this wrapped up in July. Um, for release of the draft general plan. Um, <clears throat> uh, so other goals for the planning division, uh, we're gonna, we are now have a new accessory dwelling unit ordinance. We're gonna really promote that and we're working with the county as well and other cities are collaborating on uh, doing ADU outreach and uh, tools for property owners to encourage that. Uh, again, we're looking to expand the role of the zoning administrator to streamline more permits and potentially look at moving heritage trees uh, to the zoning administrator role. I know that's something that um, the city manager and Dick would love to see, um, but there's some little things we got to work on in doing that. Um, other thing we need to do is we do need to establish permanent regulations for commercial cannabis retail manufacturing, any distribution. We've done that through an interim ordinance so far um, this summer and soon we're gonna have to begin that conversation on finalizing that. Uh, we're gonna be bringing you the GHG inventory and the climate action plan over the next few months. Uh, we're gonna be working with Ross Valley Sanitary District on their soil remediation uh, for EPA clearance. Uh, they in fact have submitted today for their grading permit. Uh, to begin that remediation project. Uh, we've been talking with them for over a year now on that. And, uh, but they've now submitted it. It's gonna go to, uh, go to Planning Commission. It is a permit that requires their review and concurrently work with uh, Julian and the Public Works Department on the grading permit for that work. Uh, that's gonna be a lot of volume of, of excavation and hauling. Um, other things in building and code enforcement, we've got the 2019 amendments to the California Building Code coming up. Uh, we'll be looking at um, some more GHG reduction and reach codes and also working with the fire department on making sure the fire codes are the best and the safest for the community. Um, we'll be also adopting uh, amendments to the code enforcement ordinance. Uh, Sky has got those back to me. We've got a final draft and we'll be bringing that to you very soon. Uh, that's gonna give us some added tools. It's kind of clarifying, unifying the code enforcement sections of the code. And it's also gonna give us tools for administrative citations and administrative appeals. Uh, so we'll have less of these nuisance abatement processes that end up at the council. Uh, we as staff will be able to issue fines and I think that's gonna be hopefully far and few between, but a necessary leverage to really get people's attention if needed. Um, and with that, the Heritage Preservation Board, we're gonna work with them on expediting and completing uh, their uh, inventory update. So with that, any questions for, I'm done. So any other questions are on you. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty amazing report. 
Any questions from the council? <coughs> Very impressive, Neil. Would you consider some background music next time? <laughs> <laughs> no, not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least we okay. know you're never bored. Yeah. All right. Neil, wow, that's pretty impressive. Thank you, Neil. Nice job. Okay, are you the are you the finale? Uh, Kathy and I. Kathy, and First okay, Kathy your and team. Team so effort. So we'll start with Kathy, our administrative service director, Kathy Orman. Um, focus, I think, heavily on the finance uh, department, and then uh, I'll wrap up. Super. Oh, um, you need to turn the mic. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. The department is really mandated by a lot of hard deadlines, state, federal, county deadlines, <clears throat> reporting, making sure we get payroll out on time, helping everybody make sure that the vendors get paid on time. And um, with that, it, I've, in the past, I've made it goals that we always have manuals, that we could follow procedural manuals, and that to make sure that we're all cross-trained, to make sure that the department continues to function, so without one of us. And back um, at our management retreat, Dan had asked our managers if he thought that if, our, if the director was out, whether or not our department could survive and how long, and my hand shot up and said, yeah, we could do this. Well, I got tested. <laughs> I think just a few days later, she thought she'd proved the point. <laughs> so uh, my department, and um, I'd have to say to very kudos to the two ladies that work in our department. They, back in October, I got hurt and I was out. And even though I was at home and I was working a lot from home, it also highlighted a lot of areas where we needed to have more training, um, that my office needed to be a little has to be more training and more transparent there because I have a whole list of things that I do that they have no idea that I do, um, which continues to function. But then after I came back, we also had payroll go out and tested Jen and I to see whether we could stand up and take over payroll and keep moving forward. Now I have to give Jen really kudos because she's been the pillar through all of this turmoil. Maria is now back, and I have to say that payroll has gone out and that we were able to function, but it wasn't without the pains and wasn't without showing that we still need some cross-training and a lot more manuals. So with that said, I'm just proud of the, my ladies, and um, we've accomplished a lot through there, and things keep going smoothly, so that's a good thing. We're, we're so happy you're back healthy yeah. <laughs> and we, we did miss you. Thank you. So um, for overall administration, I went back to see what I had promised we would actually accomplish at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and we have one item that we promised you that I expect to deliver to you very shortly. And I like to say I, but it's not really me. Uh, we have one manager here who is deferring talking, which is fine. We haven't asked her in the past, but Shannon O'Hare is the assistant to the city manager and um, basically helps me get a heck of a lot of stuff done I otherwise wouldn't get done. Um, when you approve that position, communications was a core aspect of it, and we told you this year we're gonna bring you a communications plan and a program for you to adopt, and uh, we do anticipate doing that before the fiscal year's over. There is a draft, and it's, being refined and uh, we're on target there. Um, I also uh, want to remind the council that we're really fortunate to have a city clerk who has a, a background, a legal background and uh, working closely with Jamie, uh, we were able to go through the entire municipal code, identify the sections that were kind of in need of just some refinement uh, that were some of the less policy oriented sections uh, Jamie spearheaded that and led all the department heads through their sections and got their feedback. Um, that's a change. In the past, what we would have done is ask the law firm to do that. We'd ask Sky's office to do a lot of that. Instead, we were able to send things to Sky and say, we've, we've done the work. Are you okay with it? Which 
not only is it more efficient, uh, it's more cost effective. Uh, and kudos to the city attorney's office for being open to cost effectiveness. <laughs> um, we had also promised you that we would work closely with uh, at Public Works to launch the Measure B program. So again, I get to take a little bit of credit, even though Julian did all the heavy lifting with his staff. Uh, and it's really exciting to, to know it's out there and that it's gonna happen and people are seeing the results of it. And in fact, we're doing too good a job, I think, because we now we have folks really starting to be very educated about the problems on their road and asking questions that are far more sophisticated than they would have asked in the past. And that uh, puts a lot of pressure on me to, to bring myself up to speed so I know way too much about pothole maintenance now. Um, and then uh, I get to take credit for all these good people because we promised that this year we would work very hard on cost containment. And with the exception of the investment in our actual staff and our um, obligations with respect to payroll, uh, they've done an incredible job of keeping operational costs flat throughout the city. And as we move into the next budget cycle, um, we're working hard to continue that trend which will give us the capacity we need to wrestle with some of the big ticket items that you're going to be hear, hearing about over the next several meetings. Um, and I do uh, want to acknowledge Shannon O'Hare again because um, I was recently talking about what does an assistant city assistant to the city manager do and that sort of depends on on the person but one of the things I've come to really appreciate is there's a lot of cities our size that can't get to all those special little projects that the public wants to have happen. These are the ones that sound innocuous and mundane when you talk about them, but they're also the ones that fill the council chamber. And so and a good example this year was we finally got through uh, up creating and updating our massage ordinance, massage therapy ordinance, and I see some smiles on the council because what should have been a simple mundane exercise was not. Um, and those are the types of things that a lot of cities our size and staff level can't really address without farming it out to a consultant because we just don't have staff capacity and having somebody on our administrative team who can do that is really critical. We've also, to help with our budget this year, called upon Shannon to be, in a lot of respects, the de facto HR manager for the city so that we would uh, keep some of those costs in-house rather than paying other entities to do them. and. Um, She's performed superbly in that role. Uh, Bob Quinn didn't say it, but as a testament to Shannon's efforts, he's going to have a full staff for the first time in quite a while, I think starting next week, see, Tuesday. See, So uh, we're all really excited about that, and I probably just jinxed that as badly as Neil just <laughs> jinxed that there's going to be an appeal. Um, and I will take a lot of credit, though, that we finally got rid of Scott Schertz as an employee. You know, it took a long time, but... But he's off the payroll. <laughs> Somehow the budget's not going to go down, but we got him off the payroll. Um, some initiatives for next year. Uh, like many agencies, we're reinvigorated uh, and invested in improving our preparedness for emergencies and disasters. And there's two layers of that. There's an interagency component that uh, along with your two chiefs, uh, I'm spearheading in a number of committees and meetings countywide to see what we can do collaboratively. Um, and then internally, uh, we're looking at both our practices as a staff, uh, but also our emergency preparedness planning. Um, and a project I uh, talked about with the staff and just as other things have taken my uh, attention, I, I haven't been able to do, but I'm gonna turn back to you. I'm very concerned about the ability of our first responders to access all aspects of the city. We have a lot of narrow roads, and a lot of times we don't have any regulations on those roads, and the way people are parking on them, or the way they're leaving things in the street, we're not gonna be able to get a fire truck, uh, which is our means of getting a paramedic sometimes, to a home in a timely manner, and that's a scary thing. Um, 30 seconds can be the difference when a paramedic needs to respond. 30 seconds can be the difference when a police vehicle needs to be on scene. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna be looking at hard in this, in this coming year, fiscal year, this current calendar year, is uh, changes we need to make there. And there's some tough conversations to be had. It's not just people parking, but trees in the middle of streets. 
Um, you know, that's the third rail in some respect, but we have, might have to touch that one this year. Um, some of those less sexy but important internal things that we're going to be working on, I want to, um, as the council alluded to a few times, uh, we did use some of our budget capacity this year to retain a firm to do an overall assessment of our information technology. Uh, and we're not surprised we're getting feedback that we're woefully behind in a lot of areas. So there's going to be a need to make an investment there so we can meet the public's demand and we can be efficient. Um, and so uh, you'll be hearing a lot from me in the coming months about our needs in that area. Um, I think you'll have Kathy Orm and I starting to really look at our long-term financial planning, both in terms of how we're investing money and then how we're prepared to cope with our liabilities. It's a topic we've had with you before, but I think we need to uh, really start working on some modeling that, that shows the public where we're headed in all these different categories. Um, and then lastly, very interesting to me, I know it's not interesting to a lot of folks, but we're gonna instill a whole host of new best practices in risk management. Um, starting with maybe recreation directors driving forklifts. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so um, that's going to be an area that we work on a lot this year. Um, but I am very fortunate that the folks here tonight, you know, I, I enjoy this night, and I know we're a little snarky and we're a little glib, and, um, but this is a great group of folks who care a lot for this community and just want the best for Larkspur. And they make me look really good and I don't have to work as hard because of all the hard work they do. So wow. thank That's you. That's very kind of you, but Dan, you do, you do work hard. I have to tell you, I know it's been a long day and all um, for all of us, especially for you guys, but when you get, you, not only are you, in my opinion, you just, you're, you do love Larkspur and you put so much time and effort into it, but when you get up there to give your reports, your passion comes out and aren't you lucky to, to enjoy the job that you have? And Dan, you're just an incredible leader and um, what incredible staff you put together. So anyway, kudos to all you guys, so thank you. Seriously, we, we love having you work for Larkspur and being part of Larkspur. Council, any, anything else you guys want to say? Shannon Appreciation Night, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> just, We're not just, worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. I, you know, I, I don't want to pile on, but I just want to express my own personal yeah. appreciation for everything that... Dan, you do, because you play, you have lots of different Absolutely. hats that you wear during the course of the year, and you balance things in an incredible way. And we're very grateful to have you providing the leadership that you provide. So I just want to get that out there, as well as congratulate and thank uh, all of the rest of our wonderful city staff. Um, I think we have the best run uh, municipality in Marin, if not the state of California, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Truly appreciate it. All right. So Sky, do you want to? Hi, Sky. Sky, we like having you involved too. You do a nice Poor Sky, job. We've never do you really want to just give a little? I think so too. <laughs> so I was going to say, Sky's sitting there unhappy because his managing partner is complaining Sky, that he's creating efficiencies for no. legal services provided to our city. No, actually, it's it, it's actually great. I um, I think at, at various times Dan has said when this was the only thing on the agenda, do you really want to come? And I say, yeah, I actually really want to hear, you know what everybody is doing and what they're planning for the next year. Um, the council knows this, but for anybody who's watching at home now or later, uh, the city attorney's office is, a, is somewhat of a reactive um, office. We're here to support the other departments and provide guidance and, and assistance. Um, don't really do a lot of proactive things. Um, but, you know, last year uh, I worked with Dan and Julian and the whole team on Measure B, um, multiple aspects of that. Um, the reimbursement agreement with uh, Larkspur Marina um, negotiated that, although Julian and, and Dan had really laid the groundwork for it, but I worked with their attorney to negotiate that agreement. Um, reviewed no end of agreements for the Public Works Department in particular. Uh, worked with Jamie on the Municipal Code update. Worked with Neil and his team on multiple land use projects, including um, 
you know, when it reached the council, um, the amended and restated um, subdivision improvement agreement for that, what is it, four or five lot project? <laughs> um, that seemed very simple for the council, um, but you probably all know that no. in the background that was incredibly complex yeah. and um, involved working with Julian and Neil and Kristen and Dan to um, tee that up for you so that it would be a simple project for you. Um, Worked a lot with Dan and team on getting the CMFA JPA agreement finalized and dealing with the PERS issues. Um, you know, worked with on services agreements for other departments. So, um, and I guess like one thing that that I that I think about it for all of my clients is is that I use as kind of a barometer is how much litigation is my client involved in, and uh, the answer for Larkspur is one case. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. No jinx, but but no jinx. Right, but, but that's but it's a but it's a team effort. It's yes, a risk mitigation effort. Team effort. Um, but but the one case we're involved in is one that we're litigating to acquire that easement right. um, to connect the central pathway. So um, I I feel like it's a testament to everybody that that risk is managed well here, and it's great to be part of the team and help make that happen. And what a team we have. Yeah. I agree. With that, we'll adjourn this meeting. There you go. Thanks, everyone. Go home. You can